Starfield is a massive RPG that contains backgrounds, traits, skills, crew members, shipbuilding, crafting, outposts, and more. And while this is all quite confusing, I've put together all of my main Starfield guides to walk you through the entire process from character creation to every major mechanic in the game, plus fixed a couple of mistakes I originally made along the way. Let's go! But first, let's talk about backgrounds, as you only pick one of these and it's the first decisions you make and you have to pick a background, whereas traits are optional. So backgrounds basically give you a head start in a specific build direction. They don't really force you into anything specific. They basically just give you three starting skills and a little bit of backstory around where your character may have come from. Now that backstory will occasionally come into play in dialogue options. It won't necessarily change anything drastically. It may just unlock different doors for you in terms of conversation dialogue or just occasionally come up for some flavors text here and there. But the main reason you pick a background is for those three starting skills. Now, if you're not exactly sure or what sort of a build you're going to go, it can be hard to decide what background fits for you. But there is some really great general options that sort of fit any really like build or say just generally, you know, just like playing the game. I really am a fan of File Not Found. It's the one at the very bottom of the list. This is a great all around background now because this doesn't really necessarily give you any sort of specific background in terms of like dialogue. If so, you're not exactly sure what your character is going to be. But in terms of its skills, it gives you wellness for extra HP, ballistics, weapon damage to increase your percentage of damage with ballistic weapons which you'll use for a lot of the game you know until you find some say laser weapons or EMF you wanted to go that route and then piloting for thrusters on ships is also really good because the thrusters really helps with maneuverability in space and helping with space combat so just generally like a really good all-round set of starting skills and if you're not exactly sure what sort of a backstory you're going to go. Bounty Hunter is a great option if you want to spend a lot of time in space say whether that be in ship combat or transporting cargo because it comes with a target control system to allow you to enter like that sort of VATS mode so you can target specific parts of a ship either knock out their engines so you can board them or knock out their weapons so they won't attack you back and you also get piloting which we just discussed before as well as boost pack training so you can actually use the boost packs which as a critical skill which everyone will eventually grab but this essentially just means that you don't have to spend those points to grab that skill. Cyber Runner is great for a stealthy sort of archetype because you already come with stealth and pickpocketing if that's the route you wanted to go with. I also really like in industrialist or diplomat for say persuasion if you want to focus on say dialogue and speech challenges but industrialist is a little bit better in my opinion because you get security and research methods so security mainly here because it enables you to increase your overall pickpocketing capability which is also good but otherwise there are some great options say if you want to specialize in certain types of weapons like say soldier for example if you wanted to maybe focus more on the ballistic weapons or go something like the ronin for dueling but generally speaking you can't go wrong with a background it's just a head start into a specific direction. Traits, however, are a different story. So traits, as mentioned, they are optional and you can pick up to three of them. Not only do they add extra flavor and they do also appear in dialogue occasionally as well, they can push either your build a little bit further into a direction if you focus on, say, like combat focused traits or even also the role playing aspects of your kit. Say if you wanted to pick up a religious trait to focus, say, on, you know, your character being extremely religious and picking those options in dialogue. But we'll cover the best traits sort of generally across the board and then we'll get into the more like specific stuff like the faction allegiance and the religion traits. But starting out with the best traits, alien DNA, the first one in the list is really good. So extra HP and O2 being stamina is good. Like you can't really go wrong with that, especially for a melee focused build. If say you want that extra little bit of survivability. ability, the negative effect here being your healing items and food are less effective. You can counteract this a bit with the medicine skill. So it's not too much of a big deal because you can bump up those healing effects in that way, but having extra HP and O2 to, you can't really go wrong in that route. Extrovert, I also really like, or say introvert, if you don't want to have a companion, say if you know you're going to have companions, then extrovert's great, and then vice versa for introvert, if you know you're not going to have companions. Keep in mind, though, that there are some main missions and side missions that will force you to have a specific companion with you while you complete that mission. So if you are an introvert, you'll then be getting those negative effects during that mission or until you complete that mission. Say if you know they join you because they want you to go and do a specific mission, Mission, but if you go off and do something else and you can't actually force them to leave you until you've done that mission, then you're going to be stuck with those negative effects until you get to that point. Hero Worshipped will have you get the adoring fan, everyone's favorite crew member. Now, obviously they're annoying, but they're also fun. Like that's their whole point. I really actually enjoy their dialogue. There's a lot of funny little lines that they will have with you and sort of back and forth, but it's also good to just have like a free crew member because crew members are pretty expensive to hire. And also just say, if you don't like the companions, you want like a different option 
in that route as well. You've got someone that can come with you. The Doring fan's a little bit better to come with you based on his skills. They're more focused on actually you yourself and ground play rather than like improving your overall spaceship and capacity in that route. But it just gives you an extra option to add to your crew or sort of have come with you if you don't like the other companions plus the gifts he gives you well worth having kid stuff is probably my favorite trait now kid stuff the cost of actually having your parents is pretty low like very rarely will they ever take money from you and it's like 500 credits every week it's super low effort like it doesn't take much and they don't take much but they are damn cool so they will send you letters occasionally if you are doing certain activities sometimes i'll give you unique armor or weapons and they will appear around the galaxy randomly and just you'll be able to talk to them and there's heaps of flavor text here and there is a great back and forth with them i really recommend picking up kid stuff they're actually hilarious taskmaster is great for ship repairs if you're going to be spending a lot of time in space say for example if you went like the bounty hunter background as well now this is great because like the hiring cost is obviously more expensive right to hire people but the you can use the persuade option to lower that cost a little bit still so it's not as bad but it is only a one-time cost right so you're not going to be hiring a lot of crew members all of the time it's really just like specific moments that say you want to but you'll always have that effect if you have a crew member that specializes in those parts of the ship so then you can have those ship parts automatically repair which is well worth having terra firma is also great a bit like alien dna in that you get the extra hp and o2 while on the surface but you have less while in space now 90 percent of the game you will be on a planet like on the surface so you'll get those extra hp and o2 benefits very rarely will you be fighting in space and if you do like you know you just need to be mindful that you'll have those negative bonuses but it's it's not that often like unless you're going to be stealing a lot of ships like you know knocking out their engines and boarding them to take ships a lot then maybe it comes into play and there are definitely some missions that are set in space that you will do things in space but it's just worth calling out that for the most part you'll spend a lot of that time on the ground so it's just a free hp and o2 buff for that period of time let's cover some of the more specific trait choices like faction allegiance traits you can only pick one of these being the free star collective settler the neon street rat or the united colonies native now this is good if you want to say focus on a bit more role playing aspect like a specific faction but there's pretty low sort of drawbacks here in terms of negative effects unless you're planning to be a criminal because you'll get that extra bounty in those other territories but for the most part here you can pick one just as a safe option to give you some extra dialogue when you're in those sort of territories like on say a killer city or in new atlantis the religion traits aren't really worth it so the main two here being the raised enlightened and raised universal you get access to a special chest in like their churches but really there's not really any good rewards in here so there's nothing really gaining from it but then i guess for the most part here also you're not gaining any negative effects either so it's not that much of a trade-off i would only really pick one of these if you are say planning to focus on like a role-playing aspect like you're looking for dialogue options as i actually found that picking raised enlightened like i did there is heaps of interesting dialogue options that come up both in the main story as well as some of the side quests as well just because of my religious choices there and serpent's embrace is sort of the same except it has different benefits and doesn't have that chest but they will come up to play because you can only pick one of these religious traits if you want to go that route let's cover off some worst traits to sort of avoid firstly dream home sucks don't grab it 125k credits is a huge debt to have and you really just like won't ever want to pay that off like why would i give them 125k unless you're obviously for role paying purposes but gal bank are going to steal all your money so don't do it now if you do pick up this trait and you do go to the dream home it's not a bad house right like it's pretty cool but you could just build an outpost for free that doesn't cost you anything and if you want to use this house without actually paying the 125k you can just pay 500 credits every week if you want to go there and access it so you can get it but it's just worth calling out that you're going to have that quest in your quest log for 125k debt until you actually go and pay that off empath is also sort of random because i mean if you do actions in the game when you've got companions like who knows if that action is going to either make them like or dislike that action and if they like the action you get buffs if they dislike you get negative effects so because of that randomness that can be sort of fun if you're looking for a little bit more chaos or chaotic sort of play there but i wouldn't worry too much about empath unless you wanted to go that route so firstly, let's talk about early game credits. Now credits is a massive function in this game and actually getting income and you can get a fair chunk of just like early game credits to either spend on different items that you want to buy or just like starting to build up that income stream so you can eventually buy a better ship. So the first thing you should do once you arrive on New Atlantis is go to the Gull Bank. Now you can here become a debt collector and these are like short missions where you'll seek out someone who owes credit and in most cases you can either take those credits by force or persuade them to just give you 
you those credits then you bring them back to girl bank to get paid and you can keep doing this over and over again for different missions that are all slightly different so they're fun to do just to get some free like easy credits without having to do too much you should also go to the ssnn the settled system news network building and talk to the receptionist here you can initially tell her about your escapades with the argus mining company in like the intro and she'll give you some credits for your travel but you can actually continually do this throughout major events that happen that are like considered newsworthy and go back to her tell her about those events and she'll give you more credits as well so it's just another free way you can make credits so just consider stopping by every time you go back to new atlantis just to tell her what you've been up to or what's been happening around you and she'll give you some free credits for the information next i would suggest don't ignore constellation now it can be tempting to go off on your own and explore once you're given free reign and you absolutely should do that at some point but they aren't Puppy. preston garvey telling you that another settlement needs your help they are a hugely useful faction for both story and outside of story purposes i'd recommend to stick with constellation through the old neighborhood quest as it's like an extension of the tutorial it'll teach you pretty much all the like initial important things you need to know and at the end of that you'll get a constellation spacesuit and helmet you also get a boost pack which is great for some early game armor in order to use like the actual boost pack on the boost pack you need the boost pack skill in the tech skill tree lots of words there but if you jump into the tech tree you can grab the boost pack skill so you can actually use the boost pack but there is also a workshop downstairs in constellation that contains all of the crafting stations as well plus there is a constellation mission board here that you can use to survey planets and gain information about them for extra credits once you've completed that quest as well you'll have a pretty solid understanding of the game's core systems plus a couple of companions at your back plus some decent armor and it sort of sets you up pretty well to like take on the game and sort of go out and explore and do other things but before you leave new atlantis i would suggest to go to the mast building and talk to the commander there as you can then join the uc vanguard now generally speaking you should you know join all the factions that you want to join but you can join the uc vanguard pretty early on and when you do you'll go through like a museum like tour that'll teach you about the world of starfield and sort of learn about where the political players in the world currently are what's bothering them what's happened just sort of in the immediate past and there's a lot of lore that comes from that it's a really interesting experience that really helps you understand starfield and these characters and these factions that are you know there's going to be a lot of names and factions and people that are going to be you know presented to you very quickly and i found that that really helps me understand what was happening in the world but at the end of that museum tour there's also a ship combat simulation and i found this simulation to be hugely helpful to learn like ship combat in a you know, like a safe environment right like in the early stages of the game you don't do heaps of space combat and if you do it's in a very sort of small scale so it helps you learn those mechanics nice and early and sort of play around without having to worry about losing your ship because you know you're in a simulation there's different challenges you can do from it as well to try and build up your tiers but i'd recommend to do this to give you that lore information as well as help you understand ship combat once you have got access to it now where to go after new atlantis that is a big question you've obviously got the main story which you can go and do but there's also a whole galaxy there to explore and i would consider once you have that access to explore the world to go to all of the major cities so for example here aquila city the capital of the free star collective in aquila this is in the Chien system or you could go to Neon on Vole Alpha in the Voli system. These cities as well as New Atlantis and a few others that I won't mention are major quest and like location hubs that have plenty of content to do just like on those planets and with the people themselves. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed by the size and scale of the game which I really was at my early stages I found that spending time on Aquila City and just doing the general side quests here and talking to the people and spending time in that environment really helped ground myself in the world these major locations have heaps of experience to gain because there's a lot of missions to complete there's also a lot of resources in these systems because they are inhabitable by people which means there's a lot more resources in them so you can gain those resources to farm and those levels and xp and just general gear that you get i will also mention that if you're wondering what mission or quest to do they don't actually have level requirements so a good way to check this is if you go to your missions and choose the show on map option it'll show you the system that that quest is actually in and systems actually have level requirements in the top left so you can see that okay this mission right is in this system that is a level 25 system maybe i'm not ready for that yet so you can sort of decide what you're doing based on that as it's very easy to stumble on areas that are maybe a little higher level for you so it's just good indication there next i would recommend to start a resource farm so resources are a critical part of your success in starfield and if you'd like to do any sort of crafting or outpost building it's really important to start that collection as early as possible a common hurdle that i ran into during my first 20 hours or so 
episode was not having enough resources to either actually just research any new technologies or upgrades at the research lab, but also crafting any mods for my weapons and armor. You can collect resources on planets just by wandering around and simply using your cutter, but a great way to automate this process is with extractors at your outpost. I would suggest to start this process by some of the more commonly used resources when you're scanning planets and trying to find the different resources. A couple that I would really look out for is iron, copper, but especially aluminum. Aluminum is used in practically everything and it's a really hard resource to come by. So in order to start like a resource farm like this, you want to find the resource you're looking for, right? So using aluminum as an example, CODIS, which is a moon of Aquila, has this resource. So you can scan the planet and find exactly where that resource is located. And then you want to land your ship in that sort of general area. So once you're on the ground, you want to find using your scanner where that resource is in the ground so you can extract it out. If you get lucky and you have a location that has two different resources in the ground next to each other, build your outpost in the middle because you'll get access to both extractors. So you can extract both of those elements out of the ground. But by building an outpost, you'll get access to the different extractors that are available in that area. You want to build those extractors and power it with either solar or wind. Depending on the planet that you're on, you can actually check what that power at wattage will be for either solar or wind and build whichever one is most beneficial here. So I'm using wind in this example. And then the extractors will start and you'll start gaining those resources. So you can return to this location often to collect up those resources or you can store them in like a storage container so the resource collector itself doesn't fill up. But you can also buy these resources and materials if you don't want to go through this process, right? There are vendors in towns that'll sell them. Also, there are mining outposts you'll find on planets and they actually have vendors that'll sell you raw materials often as well. So if you don't like to go that collection route, it's another option you can go. And the last major thing I will say is to take your time. There is more to see and do on the major planets than you realize. There is a ton of side quests and hidden things to find, characters to talk to and all sorts of stuff there. Guards will often tell you about potential quests or activities in the major cities, but even outside of the major cities, there is so much to see and do. Like this game is gigantic. There is so much in terms of its planets and different things that you can find in space. It often feels overwhelming. And if you're in that sort of overwhelming state, which I have definitely felt, I would recommend to just stick to one sort of planet or system, familiarize yourself with those locations and set yourself a goal of say what you're trying to achieve, right? Like faction quests, say if you, you know, you want to join the Freestar Collective, just focus on those faction quests for a little while to sort of get through that point. It'll help you understand the game's world and how it functions because you can definitely get Get lost in the stars. So first let's talk about experience points. Now as with all Bethesda games, every time you take a nap, you will wake up with an XP buff for the next 24 hours. Now if you have a love interest, you will get an extra bonus to that amount of XP as well for that next 24 hours. You can also get a small XP buff from drinking alien tea and its different variants as well if you do want to craft those just to give yourself a little bit of extra buff. But really the sleeping is the main one, so just make sure that if you're sleeping every 24 hours, especially if you're running a lot of repeatable missions that give XP, that 15% experience bonus is actually pretty solid. So let's make some credits. Now, the main way that you will make credits sort of throughout the game in a rapid format is from contraband and smuggling. Now, I did cover this extensively in my smuggling guide, so go and watch that full video if you want a complete breakdown of how all of this works and everything you need to know. But at a very high level, you'll find contraband throughout the world as well as on some Crimson Fleet ships and Varun ships, that's sort of a thing and you can trade contraband at any trade authority vendor throughout the world. The downside to that is that you'll typically have to pass a scanner check in order to land on that town or village settlement whatever to actually be able to trade your contraband. The best vendor to actually go to is the key which is the Crimson Feed Capital Star Yard as here there's no scanning in that system and all the vendors there will accept contraband so you can go there and pump all of your contraband there for credits and it's just a really great way to transfer all of that into just straight money and while you're there you can actually run smuggling missions and smuggle contraband into the actual settled systems via the Crimson Fleet mission board. Speaking of those mission boards, in general, they are the best way to consistently make credits as well as experience regularly because it's a consistent way of enemies to fight to gain experience and loot to gain as well as you can find contraband and also just gain credits from completing the missions. So the first is Constellation. Now they have a mission board downstairs at the lodge. These are mostly surveying missions and they seem to generally 
generally give you a higher amount of credits, especially the trait, like the planet trait ones. And it's mostly because they take a really long time to do, especially the planet trait ones, because you've got to scan an entire system looking for a specific trait on a planet. Now, there are ways to make this quicker. And even in some cases where you just have to like fully scan a planet, right? Like if there's lots of flora and fauna, it, it does take a while to actually scan everything. So that's typically why you get more credits. But if you're looking for a bit more of like a chill sort of zen vibe to grinding out those credits and experience that sort of thing because you do get solid experience from actually surveying a whole planet as well so it is worth doing and you can sort of do them regardless of your alignment with any of the factions as well the trade authority mission boards are another one now you'll find these on their star yards or just like generally around like i'm pretty sure there's one at the hitching post in aquila but these are short cargo transfer missions or passenger transfer missions that sort of a thing that are pretty simple to do it's typically like a lower payout but easy runs just like take the cargo or the passengers and drop them into a different system, land them there, give that passenger or cargo over and you'll get some credits for doing so. The Freestar Collective also have a mission board found in the Rock and Aquila City. Now for the most part, this is like protecting Freestar Collective systems from pirates and other threats like spaces, that sort of thing. If you're playing like a prototypical like good guy, this is definitely the best way to farm enemies and loot and XP. So an example being here, right, you can take a mission to take out a Crimson Fleet ship and you knock out their engines, you can board it, you can kill all the dudes on board and then grab all the loot from the cargo hold, the captain's locker and the bodies, but also keep a lookout for contraband as often Crimson Fleet ships will carry contraband. So you can take that contraband and then take it into the settled systems or even take it to the key and go and sell it for extra credits. Plus the credits you get for actually completing that mission as well. Now, if you are a member of the Crimson Fleet, like I currently am and I'm a member of both, you'll need to make sure that you take out everyone on board so that you don't actually maintain a bounty. If you de like defeat all of the witnesses, your bounty will actually get wiped though sometimes you will still keep a little bit of a bounty so if you have a self-service bounty clearance machine at either one of your outposts or somewhere you can actually go and clear your bounty and then you can go to the key to deliver the contraband or something like that but just be mindful of those bounties now the united colonies don't really have a mission board in that way but commander tura can actually give you some of these sort of like mission style things like in the united colony space by talking to him you can run vanguard missions or help with the terramorph problem and it sort of operates very similarly to like the Freestar Collective missions. It's just they are a little bit different in that way. Now, the Crimson Fleet, which we touched on a little bit earlier, also have their own mission board. And this is definitely the Space Pirate mission board. So this is smuggling goods and committing acts of piracy on, you know, different spaceships as well as stealing from merchants. All that sort of fun stuff. You get a plenty of credits from doing these. It's just, you know, maybe not the most legal method to gain credits. But you can definitely have a lot of fun by doing this if you're playing that sort of a Space Pirate role and if you want to get credits in that way without having to join say the Freestar Collective or the United Colonies you've actually got that other option there as well. I'll also mention as well that you can check the mission section on the help menu for all of the different available types of like mission types on the mission boards and again there's so much good information on this help screen I can't recommend telling people about this enough like if you haven't heard me mention it before I'm trying to mention this help screen in a lot of my videos because it's actually really really good and you should definitely be using it. So while mission boards are definitely a great way to earn credits there are like other ways, right? You know, you can sell general weapons and armor and resources that you find throughout the world. Resources, especially the rare ones, will have a higher like selling value, obviously, and weapons and armor as well. You can just see like what they're worth when you pick them up. So pick them up and then you can go and take them to different vendors to be able to sell them. Selling stolen ships isn't really a great option because you don't make heaps from it. It's obviously fun to steal ships, but because you have to register the ship before you actually sell it, you're only really getting like anywhere from like 2,000 to 5,000 credits. And for the amount of effort you go through to go through that entire process it's not really worth it but you can if that if you like i personally am a big fan of the survey data with vladimir so anytime you completely survey a planet or a system or anything you'll get like a survey data like slate that you can take to vladimir and actually sell for survey data now he doesn't have heaps of credits like he runs out of credits very quickly but if you're doing a lot of constellation missions or just exploring a lot some of these planets take like no time at all to actually just survey like in especially for gas giants right gas giants you literally just have to scan them and you get the slate which is like a thousand credits and you just need to take it to vladimir so for these sort of things go and scan these planets and systems and then any time that you say you've got a bunch of them you can just go to vladimir and sell them all and you'll be able to get a fair bit from back from that while you're at the lodge as well you can sell different things to noel if you want to sell like eight items then noel will buy those from you and she's got a fair amount of credits
credits that you can get as well. One of the best things to sell that it's the same in all BGS games is ammo. Now, ammo doesn't have any weight, and if you're like me, you just pick up every single piece of ammo that you see throughout the world, regardless of if it's the weapon you're using or not. There's ammo everywhere, and we're just going to pick it all up. So, what you should do with the ammo that you're not actually using is sell it, right? Like, it weighs nothing, and you're going to have thousands of it, or hundreds of it, and each one piece of ammo is worth a fair amount of credits, and you can just sell them to vendors and get the rewards from that, right? Like, it's a really easy way to just gain credits, but make sure you check with your weapons to make sure you're not actually selling ammo for weapons that you're actually using, but any of the other ammo types, right, just go ahead and sell them, because you're not going to use those weapons anyway, and it's just free credits. Like, I mean, who doesn't like free credits? I like free credits. Do you like free credits? So first, let's talk about planetary hazards and afflictions. So you ever wonder when you're like wandering around on a planet and your compass like randomly starts beeping at you? It's because your suit's like inbuilt protection is failing or it has failed. And once it's failed, you have a chance to gain an affliction. Now, there are multiple different types of afflictions from typical injuries, like say if you fall off a cliff and break your leg, you know, something like that. Or if you get diseases from like plants or the different elements or like standing in corrosive puddles, that sort of a thing. Now, some of these will just lead to debuffs that you can view in your status menu but some of them will also actually deplete your health via environmental damage when your health will go into like an orange section this functions very similar to like rads in fallout so if you ever wondered why your health is randomly going orange and you can't like heal past that point it is environmental damage and what you can do to get rid of environmental damage is essentially just go somewhere that is like safe right so that could be your ship that could be like inside an outpost essentially somewhere where you're outside of the elements and then and eventually after a little bit of time that bar will then start to deplete and you'll be able to heal back through your normal rate now you can increase your overall resistances to things like this in the general hazards via the resistances in the spacesuits and armor that you're wearing there is thermal airborne corrosive and radiation now when you take any sort of these types of damage they will view that specific icon on your compass so say thermal you'll have the thermal icon or airborne that airborne icon corrosive radiation etc so when you land on a new planet or or you say walk into something you shouldn't you'll be able to see what type of damage that is because it'll have that same matching icon so so an example being say if you land on a planet that is like extremely cold right like you might need to increase your thermal resistance so you might want to put some armor on that is for thermal resistance to sort of protect you and hope that you don't get frostbite right so you can actually see and match up those icons in your menus based on that now if you do get afflictions there is multiple ways you can heal them one is just by going to a doctor and asking them to heal you and they'll heal you but you can actually carry around aid items that can heal basically all of the different categories so in your aid menu where you can see your health and it'll actually show the status as well you'll have various aid items that will match up with those different icon types of the different afflictions that you may have you essentially just need to consume that item and it will then clear you of that affliction so because of this shows it on the aid screen as well you don't have to tap back into your status menu but it's a quick way to sort of see all right i've got you know the red affliction whatever that red affliction is and then you can clear it via using one of these aid items so anytime you go into a town or you need to get some aid items like if you're going to buy med packs or something it's good to grab a few of these different items as well just in case you do get them while you're exploring on planets and you mostly get these sort of afflictions on the random planets that you'll find like if you go to different places that are sort of outside general territory like those different locations you might find that these often have a lot of planetary hazards so just be mindful of that now if you ever want more information about something like these hazards or just things in general one of the biggest things that i found is that if you pause the game and you can go to the help screen there is a list of different articles here that will give you so much information about systems and mechanics and they honestly aren't really explained anywhere else so it's a really good idea to pause the game and go to help and view this screen as well you can view stuff like you know the environmental damage that we touched on earlier or anything like that in this screen as well so highly recommend reading the help screen if you're ever stuck and you're looking for more information about stuff you are wasting credits or i was wasting credits credits we're all wasting credits let's be honest so ships are definitely the coolest part of starfield and i have wasted a ton of credits just upgrading and modifying the frontier or like the basic ship you get at the start of the game without really knowing that i was going to ditch that ship pretty quickly as soon as i either had enough credits to buy something that was better or just get a free ship there are multiple quests that will reward you a ship just for doing it or even stealing a ship so if you want to steal a ship you need to use the targeting control system skill or just get lucky by knocking out the ship's engines then you can board that ship and kill the crew and then you just
just pilot that ship, take it back to any sort of spaceport, register it as your own ship, and then you've got that ship for yourself. You can then sell the ship, but you don't make heaps of profit off selling a ship that you've then had to register and then sell. But the main crux that I wanted to talk about here is that in the ship builder, right, like if you're spending a lot of time trying to like upgrade, you know, the frontier or like the basic ship, a lot of the really core and best components are actually locked behind the starship skill which takes a long while to actually get now you will need the starship skill plus the piloting skill so you can get those higher class and higher quality ships to be able to use them in like the ship builder and something that i was sort of stuck with is like i sort of hit the plateau i guess with where i could upgrade the frontier but i'd wasted so many credits when i could have used those credits to actually just buy a better ship and the reason that you should either buy a better ship or steal one is because those ships actually have parts that you can't craft at that point if you don't have the starship design skill for example here right with the shield breaker you know i've got much higher quality parts for my ship and components that are using like starship design rank three and rank four which i personally don't have but because i bought a ship that has them already i can then go into the ship builder and edit the ship how i see fit while actually maintaining those parts that i technically can't craft at the moment but because i've bought a ship that already has them i can use them freely in the builder so you've got freedom to be able to do it in that way but it's just worth calling out that you know investing heaps of money into your ship in the early days is probably not the best and saving up to either buy a better ship or just like steal one and then upgrade that ship is probably the better way to go it's also worth mentioning as well that shipyards will sell different ships and then the higher levels you get throughout the game they will then start selling different ships as well so be sure to check back often at different vendors and try to find a ship that you actually like don't carry your burdens carry capacity is a huge burden in starfield and you'll spend plenty of time wandering around carrying 20 cups and then wondering do i need 20 cups am i going to sell them what am i going to do with these cups anyway but there are multiple ways to increase your carry capacity the first being the weightlifting skill which just increases your carry capacity the payload skill will increase your ship cargo's capacity which is where you should dump all your resources and anything you don't want to carry on you anytime you get back to your ship just dump them in the cargo hold or you can just add more cargo hold to your ship via the ship builder which we just touched on a little bit and you can also have your companions carry your burden now resources are sort of the big weight carrier here and, and resources are very heavy and you can move all your resources to a storage container via one button I often do this like as soon as I get back to my ship I just dump any resources I have just back into my cargo hold because anytime you go into like a crafting or a research project it will use your personal inventory and your ship's cargo inventory as well so you don't have to be carrying all that stuff it will use the cargo hold it won't use your companions inventory or say for example a great tip to do is if your cargo hold is full you just dump everything on the ground and you know just have it just float around in your ship it won't count towards the weight of your ship in that case you won't be able to use it in any of those crafting menus unless you put it into your cargo hold or your personal inventory but it's just worth calling out and along those same veins resources not junk is the big tip here so starfield is filled with all of those miscellaneous items that you would be used to from a fallout or a skyrim and, and you know if you come from a fallout you've got that same habit that i do where you pick up literally everything that is on the ground because you can then break that down into its core materials that you can use for like crafting and building up your settlement that sort of a thing in starfield it's a little different basically all of the miscellaneous items can only be sold you won't use them in any sort of crafting there is some exceptions to this rule as there are specific items that are used in crafting now you can craft these yourself as well via the industrial workbench but for the most part you'll find a lot of these out in the world and you'll be able to tell when you found them because they actually say like that this is a uncommon or rare crafting material like resource and that you know it can be used in that regard whereas the miscellaneous icons just say what their value and weight is if you're looking to farm resources there's a fair few ways you can do this so you can farm them on planets themselves via either plants or like rock mineral deposits or the animals on planets as well this is the most consistent way to get different resources i found and often animals and plants will give you some of the more unique resources like say cosmetics or something like that that are often hard to find so finding animals that actually have those resources is well worth doing and remembering where they are in space you can shoot rocks as well to grab mineral deposits from them i haven't really got any rare resources from doing this but there's plenty of them to find if you say you just need like a bunch of iron or something like that and a really great way to do this as well is via extractors at your outpost so if you build an outpost on top of the ground where there is a resource in the ground you'll have the option to build an extractor on top of that which will then once powered give you that specific resource over time as long as it stays powered and doesn't actually fill up but it's like an unlimited way that you can gain 
saying that so you find a rare resource that's worth a lot of money and you want to sell it or essentially aluminum is a great one to actually farm because aluminum is used in like everything so it's a great resource to farm in that way if you want a bit more of a detailed guide on how to build a like resource farm my things to do video covers that and i'll link that for you guys here but but if that's too much effort for you you can just go to a vendor that sells resources and buy them as well like mining outposts always have vendors that sell resources and then the typical traders that you find in towns can get you them as well it's also worth noting like on this junk and resources that digi picks actually come under the misc category so if you're like selling all your junk just don't sell all your digi picks by accident Next is to do the factions. Now, being such an overwhelming game, it is hard to decide what to spend your time on. And I didn't delve into the factions until well into my playthrough, maybe 30, 40 hours or so. And I kind of regretted it because when you finish those story and quest lines, they give you heaps of rewards. For example, as a free star ranger, you get a really nice armor set as well as a free ship, which is like an amazing ship. And I'll let you discover what happens when you complete the other ones. I don't want to spoil all of the rewards here, but just po worth pointing out that they are really valuable rewards and also really great stories. Like there's a lot of really good lore and actually interesting missions in these faction quest lines. So absolutely do them. They can do all four factions on the one character if you like, obviously depending on your role play decisions, but they are absolutely well worth doing. And a bonus mistake. I'll give you this one for the road as well because everyone I've talked to seems to be doing this one thing. Now do the main story. I know it sounds stupid. Either like you're like, oh, why would I do a main story in a BGS game? Or you're like, of course I'll do the main story. It's a video game. You always do the main story but like regardless of what camp you're in you should be doing the main story because there are multiple things that are directly locked behind your main story progress certain parts of the game even random encounters that do not start happening until you reach a certain point in the story i won't say anything more about what that is but i highly recommend for you to actually do that and you probably hit a point where the story will actually really intrigue you like for me once i got to sort of pass that point i was super interested in the story and i couldn't actually stop doing it so if you're like worried about locking yourself out of something like by progressing the story like too far too early or something like that there is a pretty clear turning point where all the constellation members will be like hey we're going to go and do this specific thing you should join us and when they say that i'm obviously being super vague for spoilers here but when they say that you sort of know that that is a clear turning point so uh, once you hit that point then you're fine to go off and just do whatever you like unless you want to continue progressing the main story but it's just worth pointing out that you really should do the main story So generally speaking, how skills work in Starfield is every time you level up, you will gain a skill point and you can use those skills to purchase a new skill or upgrade an existing skill. So if you need to upgrade or want to upgrade a skill that you already have, you'll need to complete the represented challenge in order to unlock the next rank of that skill, which is typically just like using that skill out in the actual game. And then by spending that skill point, you'll be able to purchase the next skill. So as you invest in skill points in specific trees, you'll also unlock the skill that are further down that line, which is definitely something to consider in the sort of early to mid game when you don't have a lot of skill points as to what trees you actually want to invest further in because there's skill points later in those trees that you actually want to get access to. Because as far as I know, you can't actually respec. I haven't found a way to do so. But if anyone has found a way to do so, please let me know in the comments so we can definitely help each other out. But let's get into the best physical skills. So physical skills are a way to enhance your physical aspects of your player. So that being like your health or your carry capacity, endurance, and also your melee combat. A couple of really critical ones that you need to grab here, regardless of your sort of your build, which is what we're going to focus on for the most part in this video, by the way, is just like general skills across the board that everyone should get. But the first being weightlifting, which increases your carry capacity. This is obviously important in all of the Bethesda games because there is a ton of things that you're going to pick up. But in this game, resources are the main sort of crux of things you will pick up and they are extremely heavy and you will be carrying a lot of them and putting them in your cargo hold as well. And, you know, you've also got weapons and spacesuits and all that stuff as well. So carry capacity, definitely consider grabbing. I would also grab wellness here to increase your overall max HP. I don't think we need to say much more on that. It's pretty self-explanatory why you need more HP. Fitness will increase your O2 capacity, which is essentially like your stamina bar. So when your O2 runs out, you'll then go into the CO2 bar, but the increasing your overall O2 capacity just means you can sort of run further, which you'll definitely do in a lot of planets because there are a lot of times when, you know, you're sort of running between different locations just while you're exploring on planets. I hold down the sprint button like all the time. So it's definitely 
helpful. Gymnastics is also a huge buff because you can combat slide, which is super fun. So consider grabbing that if you are investing in the physical line as it is in the second tier. And also if you are going to be doing a bit of stealth, the stealth skill you definitely should grab as this enables the stealth meter. You won't have it without it. You can stealth without the stealth skill, but you just won't be able to see exactly, you know, how stealthy you actually are. And it will obviously give you buffs to stealth as well. Social skills lean into adding dialogue options or NPC interactions, as well as your crew and companions and a couple of outpost skills if you're considering investing in this tree. Some really early ones you should grab is definitely scavenging. Now, initially the first tier of this will increase your credits you gain from containers, but as you invest further into scavenging, you'll find additional ammo and other things, which is also very important because obviously in these games, you do heaps of scavenging. So it's very important to get as much out of that as possible. Theft is also great for you stealth homies out there. If you do pick up the stealth skill, definitely grab theft as well. It does enable pickpocketing. You can't pickpock without it. And you can then go and pickpock enemies and civilians and anyone you see fit. Persuasion and bribery sort of go hand in hand as both being dialogue skills, but persuasion is definitely the first one that you'll grab. It's in the first tier and it just increases your chance of success with any of these speech challenges in the persuasion system. And then bribery unlocks additional options. So you can actually bribe people, but definitely invest in persuasion first as there is a lot of scenarios where you can actually persuade people to do things for you or sort of get out of situations without having to initiate combat or do things in other ways. It's definitely a valuable skill if you want to be a bit of a talker in Starfield is definitely an option to consider for those reasons. And regardless of your build, commerce is a great skill because you can then buy items for less and sell items for more, which is great because you will definitely be selling a lot of items in Starfield as you come across heaps of different things that you can sell to make income because you will want a lot of credits in Starfield, not only to buy certain resources that maybe you need for upgrading, but also to buy ships and ship upgrades. It's definitely where I've spent most of my money. Moving on to combat skills. Now, generally speaking in the combat tree here, like everything is all about weapon enhancement skills. And I would sort of focus on whatever weapon category you personally connect with, whether that be, you know, shotguns, rifles, or pistols. Or, and then once you've sort of picked a category of weapons that fit that, that you like, then I would invest into a weapon type. So that being like ballistic weapons or lasers or particle beams, whatever that specific weapon type is, is what you sort of want to focus on. So that's represented when you're looking at the weapons by say, whether the weapon damage type is physical for like ballistic or energy for lasers. So you can be able to see it there, but they can sort of be multiple things just depending on the weapon type you have, right? You can have a rifle that is getting benefits from it being a ballistic weapon, but it's also getting benefits from the rifle certification and then other ways as well. So consider grabbing skills really just that benefit whatever combat style you prefer. And obviously if you're playing as a melee character, you probably want to invest in those combat skills that are actually in the physical line. Moving on to science. Now this is everything to do with say researching and crafting as well as planet exploration and like survey skills. And the first skill you really should pick up is surveying. Now this not only adds a zoom to your scanner, it also increases the distance at which you can actually scan things when you're out exploring on planets. This is a pretty big buff because initially without this skill, you have to get so close to things just to be able to scan them, which is a little tricky for hostile creatures. So being able to scan them from a distance as well as not having to run right up to something's face just to be able to scan it is just a little bit helpful. And I've also used the zoom function a bit while exploring on planets to see things in the distance. Medicine is critical for the exact same reason that wellness is. Medicine will increase the amount of additional health that you get back from like med packs and trauma kits, that sort of a thing. So definitely invest in medicine. And then a couple of other skills that you could consider, something like geology, botany, and zoology. These will increase the amount of resource gain you gain from their specific type, right? So geology being inorganic objects, so minerals and that sort of thing that you find from planets. And botany is for the organic objects, so plants. And then zoology is for creatures, so the resources you gain from them. So if you're looking really to become a bit of a resource farmer, then invest in those three skills. But otherwise, I would consider getting into that second tree of the science skill to grab weapon engineering and spacesuit engineering, which you absolutely need if you want to research higher level modifications at the research lab for different weapons and spacesuit upgrades, because you will actually need them. And they are tangible increases exactly the same as they were in, say, Fallout 4 in the mod system in improving your overall, say, damage or capabilities with a weapon, or even just adding different functions to your spacesuit, which becomes more important 
one because of the boost pack as well, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, but the different types of boost packs that you can mod on to your backpack, which you definitely will want to do if you do find one that you prefer to actually use. And moving on to those tech skills. Now, this is where you get boost pack as well as a lot of ship focused skills, a lot of ship building and ship combat, that sort of a general focus, but the boost pack training skill, everyone should grab. So this enables you to actually use boost packs, which is like a must have skill really. So you can not only get around a little bit easier in the world, especially on planets that don't have gravity or have lots of gravity, you can be able to move around. And once you've upgraded this, you can kind of stay in the air for a long period of time. You don't have to touch the ground a lot, which is just generally fun. Targeting control system is great to unlock the target lock when you're fighting in ship combat. It's a little bit like VATS, but for ships and you can target specific parts of the ship. If you target the engines, you can knock out the engine to board the ship and take it over. Or say, if you knock out their weapons, you can stop them from firing back. It's very helpful in those encounters. Piloting is also helpful for ship combat, but also just the general like maneuverability of the ship for thrusters. So thrusters gives you more minute control over your ship. It's really good to do like quick 180s. So you don't have to do the whole slog of just like waiting for the reticle to turn around. It makes that process a little bit quicker. And the further tiers in piloting allow you to pilot higher tier ships, which you absolutely will want to do so you can improve your ship. But also, you know, if you are going to invest in some piracy, you can steal other ships from people that are of a higher class. And security is an absolute must as well, which will improve your digi picking ability. So that's essentially just like the lock picking in this game. And the more points you invest in that, you'll then eventually be able to unlock master locks. So you can sneak your way into higher quality loot from that, or just be able to sneak your way into different locations or different outcomes in ways. Like I've even found that with master locks, I've not only been able to unlock areas that can give me better loot, but also certain like quest objectives. I'm being very vague here, but like able to change things like say turning off turrets or turning off different puzzles that maybe I wouldn't be able to do without the master lock. It's been actually really valuable to have. I've just updated my membership program here on YouTube to include early access to practically every video. So if you like these sort of builds or any of the other content that I do on the channel, consider joining the membership. It costs you literally $1. You get early access to basically every video plus access to the members only discord, a bunch of other benefits as well. So if you like what I do here, please consider checking that out. But enough of that, onto the video. So first, generally speaking, as a bit of an overview, there is a crew roster screen that you will be able to view by bringing up your menu and going to the ship screen and then adding your crew. From this screen, you can see your ship as well as any outposts that you have that can actually contain crew. And you can see a list of your crew members and companions and be able to either assign them to certain outposts or your ship or unassign them to have them return to their original location if you don't actually need them anymore. If you have unassigned or aren't using companions or crew members and you want them to say, you know, come to your ship because you left something on them. You can just assign them to your ship and then fast travel to another location and they will actually just appear there. You won't invest too heavily into this overall system until a bit later in the game because of the cost of actually hiring crew, as well as some skills required to have a lot of crew members and the higher spaceships and everything. But it's worth calling out the differences here, as well as talking about the difference between crew members and companions. So crew members are typically unnamed people who are simply there to carrier burdens or to give you specific skill buffs to ships or outposts or assistance when fighting in the world. Companions are very much more fleshed out characters. They typically also have more skills. So all the main companions have four skills and they will interact with you as well as interject into dialogue sequences that you may be having. And they'll like and also dislike some of your actions depending on what you do as well as romanceable. Now all the core companions come from Constellation. Those being Sarah Morgan, Sam Coe, Barrett and Andrea. Now these will all join you throughout like the main story. So as long as you're just like progressing the main story here, they will actually just join you once you've sort of done their intro mission or they'll ask to join you. You don't have to accept. Just worth calling out that if you're looking for them, just progress the main story and you'll eventually run into them. Now they are not the only named like crew members slash companions that you find as well. So when you're out in the world, if you're looking for more crew members and you want people to join your crew or your outpost, typically at bars in any of the major towns, you'll be able to find them. There are named crew members that you can talk to that will join you that may either give you bonuses to your ship or even bonuses to your overall like health like a doctor or even bonuses to outpost but there is also unnamed ones that typically only have one skill for the unnamed now they are typically like specialist in one sort of a thing but for the most part if you're looking at crew members to invest in you probably want to invest in the named ones because not only do they have more skills but they're a little bit more interactable and they typically have backgrounds which I've found quite interesting to learn about their histories if you want some specific locations where you can 
and grab some crew members. The very first one is at the viewport in the New Atlantis spaceport. Just after you've sort of landed, if you head to the left, you'll be able to find viewport, which will have some crew members for you to join there. In Neon at the Astral Lounge and the other couple of bars there, you'll be able to grab some crew members that can join you. The Hitching Post in Aquila City is another great spot for some named crew members. I picked up Imari here who has the shield system skill to enhance my shield capacities, which has been very helpful in combat. And the Broken Spear in Sidonia on Mars is another early game location that you'll be able to find some crew members if you're looking for them. There is more out there though, but I'll let you sort of discover them on your own. I don't want to spoil every location that you can find them. After you talk to them and sort of go through their initial process, you will have to pay a fee to hire them. Now, this fee can essentially be persuaded to be less if you can pass like the persuade check, but you will need the persuade skill if you want to have a higher chance of passing that. But it is dependent on the person. Like some people will react differently to certain dialogue options when you're choosing them. So if you want to make it a little bit cheaper, try and pass that persuade check. But if you fail the check, you'll still be able to hire them, but just at the full price rather than getting the discount. Let's go through some general tips and tricks for your crew members. So firstly, there are a couple of skills that will help your crew and companion. Leadership is great because it will improve your companion's affinity towards you faster. And at the higher levels, it can give additional benefits like increasing your companion's health as well as allowing them to revive you if you do go down in combat. Ship command is a little bit further down in that social tree, but it can increase the amount of active crew members you can have up to a maximum of eight at its highest level. Now, you'll also need the piloting skill here if you want to have a ship big enough to hold eight crew members. It's worth pointing that out. So they go hand in hand, the piloting skill in the tech tree, as well as the ship command skill in the social tree. So just worth pointing that out. In the crew roster screen, if you're wondering if the skills are actually being used and if they're active, the highlighted skills are the ones that are active. So the ones that are sort of have the white layout when someone is either assigned to your ship or to an outpost. If you're wondering what those specific skills do, they are all matching and correlate with skills that you actually have on your skill tree. So if you say, look at a skill and you're like, I'm not sure exactly what that is, then go into your skill tree and find that corresponding skill. And you'll be able to actually see what its benefits are. Some crew members or companion skills aren't actually active unless you've already got the skill to initially gain its benefit. An example here is Hella and Outpost Engineering. So for Outpost Engineering, it allows you to research higher level items at the research lab, but without the skill, you won't actually initially gain those benefits from Hella. So, but any of the combat skills or anything like that are always active. So say if you've got someone that is proficient in a certain type of weapons or something, you definitely want to give them that sort of a weapon so they actually gain benefits from that. But if you need a crew member or companion, as I mentioned earlier, you can just assign them to a location and then fast travel and they will appear there if you say you want them to come to your ship because something that I've done a fair few times is use my companions as a resource mule to just hold my resources because they are quite heavy and I need all the resources and then I I forget that I did that and assign them to say an outpost or just send them back to the lodge and then wonder where my resources went. So it's a good thing to be able to assign them back so you can get those resources. But it's also worth pointing out that anything that's in your companion's inventory doesn't actually count when you're doing any sort of crafting or researching, whether that be on your ship or anywhere. So those items that are held by the crew members and companions won't show up when you're in any of the crafting station menus or in the research lab. You actually either need to hold those items in your inventory inventory or in your ship's cargo hold, both of those will show up in those menus. So it's a good thing to put things on your companions and then once you get back to your ship to take them off and then put them in your cargo hold if you've got the space or find somewhere else to put them. But by putting items in their inventory as well, whether that be weapons or spacesuits, armor, that sort of a thing, you can actually have them equipped them, which is good if you want certain companions to use a certain type of weapons because they're proficient in those weapons, or you just want them to use a better weapon than just like the default options that they have or have better armor than they initially do have, you can actually assign them to them and actually have them equip those items as well. If you'd like to be able to house more crew members on your ship, you'll need to go to a shipyard and go to the HAB modules and add any HAB module that has crew stations available. They are different to passenger slots, but when you're applying HAB modules to your ship, just pay attention to that little read down the left to see if it says crew stations and it's actually adding to the overall crew size of your ship. And similar in outposts, when you're actually on the ground or on a planet somewhere, if you want to add crew stations to an outpost so you can house crew there, you'll need to add the actual crew station object to the outpost and then you'll be able to house them on that location. You can keep adding them to be able to house more and gain additional benefits from having them all located on the one location and make sure you build a bed for them because you know it's not right for them to just have to sit in a chair all day. Except for the companion outpost skills which both impact
impact our post production. Our post management increases the raw materials gain. So think of gathering iron and copper and those materials and outpost engineering increases the material production that you gain from fabricators. So something like adaptive frame from a simple fabricator. All right, so let's start with how researching essentially works. Now, at the very start of the game, when you haven't got any of these skills, you'll have a couple of different crafting things available to you, whether that be in outposts or at the, either the spacesuit workbench or the weapon workbench, that sort of thing. But for the most part, any investment that you want to have into this crafting system, you'll need to research a specific project. And this is for all of the different categories, whether that be food and drink or outpost development or equipment for your spacesuits or weaponry for all of the different weapon modifications. So what you'll need to do to make progress in these research projects is have the resources required to research that project. As you invest further, you'll eventually need corresponding skills as well. But for the most part here at the research lab, you'll then pick a specific type that you want to invest in and then add resources that you have collected out in the world or wherever you've collected them from into that project. And then once you have filled out all of the required resources, you'll complete that project and you'll then be able to craft whatever that gives you access to do. Now, in some cases as well, you'll see like these sudden developments that'll pop up. And essentially what this is, is it will reduce the number of resources needed to complete that project. So if you add certain resources, you'll occasionally get this like sudden development where you'll just won't have to worry about collecting some of the other required resources. This is like really good for some of the harder resources to find, like the rare resources. So always put the like less rare resources in first in case you get those sudden developments and then it will automatically give you some of the other resources so you don't actually need them. Any resources that you do actually need, you can track them by hitting the track button and they'll get that little blue magnifying glass as well. So then they'll show up for you, whether it be in the world or in vendors, so you can go and grab them specifically and then put them back into the project that you're looking for. So once you're done with researching, it's time to talk about crafting. So there are multiple different crafting stations, starting with the spacesuit workbench, which allows you to craft all sorts of upgrades for your spacesuit itself. You've got the weapon workbench, pretty self-explanatory what that does. The cooking station allows you to craft cooking food and drinks and meals and the pharmaceutical lab will allow you to craft chems and aid items and then the last one is the industrial workbench now this is the major difference in starfield so some research projects or actual like mods that you might be adding to your spacesuit or even when you're in outpost building will actually require you to have a particular like crafted material and in, like the most common one for this is like the adaptive frame for just like crafting in your outpost right now you can find these out in the world like there's plenty of them around scattered around that you should grab but you can actually craft these at the industrial workbench and then if you invest in the special design skill you'll actually be able to craft some of the more rarer ones of these different crafted materials but essentially here is what you use to craft those particular items if you can't find them i would also highly recommend to add the workshop hab module to your ship so you've got all of these crafting stations and the research lab in your ship it just makes that process so much easier so you don't have to like return to constellation to go into the basement there to do crafting or something like that there are plenty of skills involved in the crafting research system as well. So first is the research methods, which gives you a reduction in the amount of resources required to complete research projects and it's high levels. It'll increase the chances of sudden developments happening as well. The Neurojack aid item also does a similar effect as well. So if you've got plenty of these, make sure you use that before you actually do any research projects. You've also got the spacesuit design and the weapon engineering skill, which will then allow you to craft all of the spacesuit mods and the weapon weapon mods as well. Outpost engineering as well as gastronomy and chemistry are also important for their corresponding research projects. There are a couple of others that are involved as well, but they're sort of the main ones you need to hit. If you're wondering which ones to focus on, the research methods is a good all-rounder because it just reduces the re cost of the resources required for either of these projects. But I personally would suggest to invest in spacesuit design and weapon mods first because really you're not going to be outpost or doing a lot of outposts until much later in the game and getting better like mods on your armor or your weapons it's just a bigger buff to your overall play style until you get further into the game and you can invest in the other ones obviously depending on your own choices but i absolutely recommend spacesuit design first now mainly because of the pack mods so once you get pack mods three you can actually change the type of boost pack that's on your boost pack itself so you'll find different boost packs that have different boost packs on them in the world but being able to actually make this change and put the one that you like the best on it is really important especially putting on the power boost pack like that's absolutely my favorite because
because it gives you such a massive boost when you trigger it. Like skip capacity is sort of like a worse basic boost because it's so short and then basic is obviously the one that you're most used to but the power one is just such a good boost because you get so high in the air it's great for those like low grab areas. I highly highly recommend it but you need to get that spacesuit design up before you can actually get it. But then obviously weapon mods as well so you can change the weapons to fit your playstyle like making them automatic or semi-automatic or add elemental damage and then later on I'd invest in outposts when you sort of pass that initial point where these things actually matter in terms of you know your overall combat prowess in combat. But the main thing we haven't talked about yet is resources like you can't do any of this without resources. Now I did mention it earlier but you can mark the resources in the project screen or even on any of these workbenches if you need to find those specific resources out in the world or from people. Also if you have the rank 4 scavenging skill these will also be highlighted with your scanner so you won't actually need to find them in the world in that way they'll be highlighted on your scanner too if anything gives you that resource you need. So finding resources or farming them can be done via a number of methods. You can farm them from plants or rocks or animals on planets. If you're doing it via this method investing in geology, botany and zoology skills for their corresponding types would absolutely help you in get more of those resources from those different things if you wanted to go that route but basically every resource can be farmed on a planet. So most common animals and plants will just give you like typical things like fiber or nutrients or something but you can definitely find them that give you some of the more uncommon or rare resources like say cosmetics that you need for like spacesuit upgrades for like all of your spacesuit upgrades so you can find them it's just they are few and far between like finding those animals and plants that give you those rare resources so when you do you want to make note of that and what planet that is if you want to return they'd actually get those resources you can also shoot rocks in space to destroy the rock and then it'll give you a mineral deposit that you can then collect the resources that'll go straight into your cargo hold as well so it just saves you that process of having to put things into your cargo hold so use the weapon systems like your ballistic weapons are often best to destroy them a really great thing to do is to build extractors on planets so a common example that i've used before is aluminum because it's such a great resource like everything uses aluminum so i have a outpost that is an extractor for aluminum on codus the moon of aquila which i return to often when i just need to grab some aluminum because you can essentially just go here and then build up your outpost if you want to build it up there but you can just build that extractor power it and it'll give you those resources if you don't want to go and get them yourself if you're you know lazy like sometimes i am you can go to a vendor now most of the like standard vendors in towns will have the resource tab which will sell you various resources but mining outposts are a great way to get some of the more unique ones as well mining outposts that you'll find on planets not the abandoned ones the actual mining outposts will have a vendor that will then sell you some of those resources as well so finding out what method works for you but i would definitely recommend to build extractors on planets and also keep notes of say plants and animals on certain planets that give you those rare resources potentially build outposts on those planets so you can return to them quickly grab those resources when you need them because you will definitely need them if you want to invest further into this system whether that be simply for you know combat enhancements to your spacesuit or weapons or even investing in outposts because there is a ton of items in the outpost system like all of your decor and robots and decor and power upgrades and extractor upgrades it's all locked behind these research projects so at the start any of the outpost stuff you have is pretty limited and you'll need to invest in that system before you can really expand your outpost to a much larger degree so it's well worth doing for that reason start with some basics and some ship overview and upgrading and then we'll get into the real crux of this video. So the firstly the main thing you need to think about is the ship manufacturers being the ship engineer people that you meet at most of the various settlements as well as some of the star yards. Now certain engineers will have different modules available to you like for example if you go to say the Stroud and Eklund star yard they will sell the best Stroud and Eklund modules for your ships but they won't sell say the Hope Tech upgrades because they're a direct competitor right. So on top of that there are also places like say the red mile and the key that will sell you like illegal parts for your ship being like the shielded capacity cargo holds and signal jammers so that you can pass the contraband scans. I have a video that fully breaks down contraband and smuggling so I'll link that here if you want to go and watch that after this video but you can also build a large landing pad at any of your outposts so you basically don't have to worry about going to these various engineers. Pretty much every single ship module part will be available at the outpost landing pad the large one that allows you to modify your ships from here. There's a couple of unique 
unique parts that may be missing, but for the most part, everything is available here from all of the different manufacturers. So you'll be able to really create a ship. And it's typically the best place to start if you're looking to build a ship is from your own pad at your outpost because you can then have access to basically everything. And then if you need something specific, you can go and find it if you do need to. Ship building is absolutely a daunting process. So firstly, before you even start thinking about building a ship or even buying a ship, I would recommend to just create a save file because then if you waste all of your credits on something you don't like, you can just go back to that save file and then start again or, you know, move on, what have you. But I'll also mention here that I'm working on a guide for the best ships that you can buy, which I'll also link here once I have finished that as well. Before we build a ship, you're going to need some skills to match. Now, if you're looking to pick a background to like focus on say shipbuilding or even the tech skills, Bounty Hunter is definitely the best because you get three starting tech skills, including piloting and targeting control systems. But you could go something like say the Long Holder, which also comes with piloting, but also the ballistics weapon systems or even Space Scoundrel, which comes with piloting or the file not found as well. Because essentially you just want to get a head start in that tech tree because then you can invest in further into piloting because you'll need the higher tiers of piloting to be able to pilot the class B and class C ships. And then as well as the spaceship design skill, which will then allow you to add these higher tier modules onto your star systems. And there are other skills as well that can obviously help improve your overall like ship's performance, like, you know, the targeting control system we mentioned or payloads for cargo hold, shield systems to increase your shields. But the main focus being a shipbuilding video is on piloting because you'll need that for certain parts of the reactors as well as starship design. Now, once you have sort of increased your overall, you know, ship's capabilities, if you're looking to increase your crew size, there's one skill in the social tree all the way down the bottom called ship command that will allow you to have more crew members on your ship as well. If you're building some big monstrosity and you need eight crew members in order to pilot the thing. The ship overview screen gives you the basics of everything you need to know about your ship. Firstly, you'll see the systems up the top that you have from your weapon systems to your engines, to your shields and your grav drive, as well as how much energy you can actually allocate to all of these various systems. You'll also see the fuel, which is about how far the ship can grav jump. The hull, which is the defensive capabilities of your ship, essentially like think of it maybe like armor. You got the cargo hold, which is how much it can hold, plus the shielded capacity, which is how much is covered by a contraband scanner, increasing your chances of avoiding those scans. You'll also see the reactors class, which is very important. Always think about the reactors class when you're looking at this, and this will come up again later. But you also see a number here, which is the number of energy slots that you can actually allocate into the various systems we mentioned earlier. You got the crew capacity, which is defined by your hab modules for those crew stations. Jump distance is the jump between how far you can go between star systems. So some star systems are like much further away from others. So the further that distance in terms of light years, the further you'll be able to travel. And shield is your total shields. And then the weapon systems underneath are obviously your weapon systems. So as you get started out in like thinking about the system, you probably start with just like upgrading your ship, whether that be the frontier or whatever ship you have. Now, essentially what the upgrade menu allows you to do is upgrade any of like the external parts on your ship. Typically, this is like your weapon systems or your shields or your engines, that sort of a thing. But you can't really get into the nitty gritty and add different modules like you can with the ship builder. But it's a really good place to start, especially if say maybe you buy a ship and you just want to make some tweaks to that ship. Like you don't want to get too deep into the system. Just upgrading your ship via this method is actually valuable to do. And it can be a quick way to make changes to your ship and those parts specifically. But the main crux is comes from ship building. So in the ship builder, you have the option to modify and add and remove all 13 different components, which we're going to break down in detail shortly. But you need to start from an existing ship. However, you can't just say start from scratch with nothing. Now, what you could do is say steal a little ship or buy a cheap ship or something like that, and then just delete every single part and have nothing there. So you can start completely from scratch if you like. But having a baseline sort of template can definitely be helpful to know, say, what you're missing or just like like general design elements that maybe you're looking for. The first thing that I would pay attention to in the ship builder screen, regardless of how you're choosing to start, is the mass and mobility. As every addition you make will modify these numbers, either positive or negative. Now, every part of the ship has a mass number and adding mass will then reduce the mobility and sometimes also your jump range of your ship, depending on how high you get that mass. So the lower the mobility, the harder it will be to control the ship in 
in combat as well as maneuver around, say to do a quick 180 if you need to like focus on a ship that like flies past you. And there are ways to mitigate say a higher mass ship and increase that mobility by adding more engines. And we'll talk about that again shortly, but it's just something to think about on this screen is that mass and mobility and always pay attention to these numbers. The best tip for understanding the ship building is paying attention to the nodes, which are these blue little highlighted circles on everything that you attach. In these nodes, you can say select them and select attach and it will show you everything that you can attach directly onto that specific type of node depending on like where it is. Now this is really great to help you sort of figure out what components can go where, but it's also good for say structural changes to your ship. Like if you're just trying to change the silhouette or just add some finer details, you can then sort of just compare the different things that can attach to that section. Before we dive into the components, I will say again, just create a save file before you get into this stuff. It just helps so much because then you don't waste those credits by adding parts or, or buying something that you don't like. It just saves you that headache. So let's get into this checklist and talking about every single specific part. So I've structured this in sort of a rough order based on the structural elements of the ship and parts to consider in, in a rough sort of order. And it's a really good checklist to like say return to if you're building your own ship and you just want to sort of think about things in a different way. Then I would highly recommend to return to this section of the video as you do build your own ship. We'll start with the landing base. Now this is the entry and exit point for your ship as you land on the ground. Now the differences here are mostly cosmetic, but pay attention to that node that has a little arrow on it as that indicates where you need to attach a hab module to. Now the hab modules are like the habitation modules where you actually can stand inside your ship and you need to have one of these attached to the landing base. So you have somewhere to actually go inside the ship. Now this can be say on the top or on the back, depending on the landing bay. So just pay attention to that. Landing gear goes hand in hand with the landing bay. Now you will need a certain amount of landing gear in order to support your ship. So the heavier the ship gets, the more landing gear you need. But for the most part, landing gear is again, more cosmetic in its looks, but you will need to make sure that the landing gear is on the exact same level as the landing bay. So they need to be like on the bottom level of your ship because it's what helps propel you, you know, up in the air and your landing bay needs to be on that exact same level. So you may get an error if they're not in line. So make sure you check the flight check, which we'll talk about again in a little bit. So keep that in mind. And then also the mass weight of your landing gear, because some of them weigh a little bit more than others. But for the most part, it's a tiny little bit of mass and it's mostly just cosmetic changes. The next major decision to think about is the reactor. Now, this is your max energy that your ship will have, which we talked about a little bit earlier for when you're powering the different ship systems. Now for the reactor, I highly recommend to pick this early in your ship building stage because this will define the class of your ship. So you need that higher piloting skill to be able to build say a reactor that is either a B or a C class, but it's also important because there are components that we're gonna talk about later, like shield generators and weapons that require higher tiers of class before you can actually put them on a ship. So you need to make sure you have a reactor that can support them. So say if you're building a C class ship, you wanna make that decision first so you know, and then you can add those C tier engines, weapons, etc., or say B tier for that same sort of a thing. So outside of the class, when you're picking a reactor, the more power you have, the better, because the more power you can apply to these different systems, you also can pay attention to the repair rate, which is how fast like your hull will repair in combat. And the reactor also adds a most of like the hull protection for your ship as well. So pay attention to that number. So the, obviously the higher hull, the better defenses. But the main decision I would make with your reactor is your class. So define that. And then you can think about say the repair rate versus the hull and the power, etc., as sort of your secondary tiers. But you've got to make sure you've got the right hull as well as the right piloting seal just to be able to fly that specific ship. I would next consider the hab or the habitation modules. This is where you and your crew sort of walk around in the inside of your ship. This is what I would consider next because it defines like the inside skeleton of your ship as it's where you walk around, but it will also determine the general sort of look and feel of your ship depending on how many habitation modules you're going for and what you're sort of focusing on here. Now, these are a massive part of the ship and there's so much to think about here. So this is one of those categories that some of the specialty star yards have additional options for, like say the brig or mess hall or something like that. But the main thing as well is when you're scanning through these sizes, especially the two by one, which is the main size that you should be adding to your ship, there are uh, different variants that add different things. Like for example, the captain's quarters doesn't really add a workbench or you know crew capacity or passenger slots. It will add a navigation console and a bed. Whereas a workshop adds like the industrial and the spacesuit and the weapon workbenches for you to use, like the living quarters, which will add passenger slots or the control station, which will add say crew stations as well. So it depends on what you're sort of going for in your ship. The different manufacturers will have slightly different interiors as well. So maybe pick ones that specific to say that you like 
better than others, but it's it's hard to say exactly what you should focus on here because it depends on what your ship is. I will say that workshops are super important because then you've got those workbenches there that you can actually use inside your ship. You don't have to go and find them. Passenger slots will allow you to transport passengers from say the mission board missions that you can get. I'll flick up here like what the different modules typically add, but it is personal preference depending on the size of your ship and what you're specifically looking for. But for the most part, it's just cosmetic changes depending on the manufacturers. And then there's obviously the different types that you'll need to consider for your specific ship. The docker is the entry and exit point when you're boarding other ships or star yards in space. Now they have full modules that you can place or they have like little node attachments that you can add. Typically you're going to put these on the top of your ship or there are the occasional dockers that will be sort of on the outer edges like on the side or the front of your ship. But you need to consider these as they always have to be on the outer edge. Nothing can be sort of above them if they're on the top or past them if they're on the edges because that's going to be attaching to other ships and you'll often get errors in the flight check if they aren't actually attached correctly. The cockpit is similar to HAB modules in that you can go in them, but it's where you control the ship from. It also provides access to your cargo hold as well as additional cargo hold. And some cockpits will also give you additional crew stations. Now a bridge is like a larger version of a cockpit. Typically bridges will go sort of like on top of a ship, whereas a cockpit will go sort of in the front. But for the most part, the cockpit is a decision that you'll make depending on what you're looking for. The higher tier ones add more cargo hold and occasionally more crew stations, but it's a little bit more aesthetically depending on like the silhouette that you're looking for on your ship that you sort of choose here. The cargo hold is like the last big component that will affect the overall silhouette of your ship. Now this is your ship storage as well as your shielded capacity and you want to make sure you check that cargo rating. Obviously the higher is better so the more storage. Cargo holds are typically a very high mass item and it definitely negatively affects your maneuverability. So finding that balance between like storage space and maneuverability is really important and the different cargo holds can attach in you know different ways. Something that I really find valuable is when I'm trying to figure out what cargo hold I'm using is using that like attached node feature that we talked about earlier and determining exactly what cargo hold I can put on each location because they have really weird snapping points and some of them are very different. So I always find that to be a little bit helpful, but depending on what you're doing, make sure you add shielded capacity as well as have a high amount of cargo hold so you can store things on them. But just keep in mind that maneuverability, which will come into play when we talk about engines shortly. The grav drive is next. Now this is a very important important part and I've saved it for this point because your jump like range in terms of light years is calculated based on your mass and by this point we've already added most of the big mass items onto your ship. So what I'm talking about here is when you're looking at the grav drive you'll see that each has like a grav jump thrust. Now this isn't a one-to-one -one transfer between like the thrust that the grav drive has directly into the amount of light years that you can jump because your ship's mass is also involved in that calculation. So the higher the mass the lower amount of light years you can jump. The number that I would be looking for to hit here for most of the game is about 25 light years. That'll get you through basically all of the systems, but some of the late, like later game systems are very far out and you probably need about a 30 light year distance in order to actually reach them, but that's like late game stuff. So for the most part, like if you're hitting say 25, it's a great number to hit and anything above 20 is like pretty solid. I definitely wouldn't be below 20 in terms of light year jump range. Engines is next. Now this is your general maneuverability. So we've added all of our cargo and mass to the ship. Now this defines your maneuverability as well as your top speed. Now you can add like a ton of engines as much as you like really and engines have a lot of stats on them but the main ones to take note of is the class. Now that needs to match your reactor class which we talked about earlier plus the max power. Now because in each of these slots you can only have 12 actual power allocated to one specific slot you need to keep that in mind when you're adding engines if your total power is above 12 you're not getting actually any return turn from that as you can only make it 12. Now the engine and maneuverability thrust will increase your mobility and maneuverability of the ship. So the higher class based on your starship design, as well as the overall class of that engine will absolutely increase your maneuverability. And it's sort of like a multiplying effect, right? Like if you're just adding your first engine, you'll see the maneuverability is going to be extremely low. But then as you add more, that number will exp 
exponentially increase. And you sort of want to hit like something around like the 80-ish mark, 90 and above. And depends on the sort of ship you're making, right? If you're making like a highly mobile, like fighter focused class, then you would definitely probably want to be above 90 and, and getting close to 100. But if you're going for like a massive cargo hauler, it doesn't matter as much. And that maneuverability doesn't matter as much either if you're using different types of weapons that we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Fuel tanks are used when you do your grab drums. Now, the more fuel you have, the further you'll be able to grab jump between systems. It doesn't affect your actual range. It just affects how many jumps you can make. For the most part, fuel tanks are pretty like inconsequential, but having a high amount of fuel will help you just be able to fast travel a little bit better, but you won't notice that much of a difference if you've got a decent grav drive. It's just something to sort of add to your ship. Your shield generator is important though. This is your shield capacity. Now you need to match the class with your reactor. So make sure you're not putting on a class of shield that's higher than your reactor. The shield max health is pretty self-explanatory what that does, but it's worth pointing out that you'll only hit your shield's max health if you have fully powered that part of your ship. And the regen rate affects how fast it will regen. And the max power is how much of that max power it takes to hit that maximum health. The Vanguard shield generator is actually amazing. And you get this just by joining the UC Vanguard. Like it's one of the best shield generators in the game and it's a super low class and very easy to get. So absolutely use this if you do join the UC Vanguard. Just wanted to call that out as it's such a great upgrade. The weapon systems are just as important as your shield. So you can have three weapon systems on your ship. Now they're assigned in the flight check screen, but we'll worry about that later. So firstly, the class needs to match your reactor again. Now consider the max power here, just like we were with engines as each one of these like specific weapons can only have up to 12. So you don't want to be above that number again, because that's, you're not actually getting anything from that. In the early game, when you've got a weaker reactor, say you're still only in like A class or something like that, I would specialize in two weapon systems because you can't really allocate full power across three different systems when your reactor doesn't have enough energy available. So specialize in two weapon systems, maximize those who get the most output in terms of combat by pump as much energy into those two systems as the higher the max power you allocate, the faster they will actually regen. So you can obviously shoot more and it's better to have those two on like max power than so be spread like too thin across multiple systems. When picking weapon systems, there's a few things to consider. Firstly, it's what type of weapon they are. Now, typically they will say like, a, you know, a laser weapon is obviously a laser weapon or what have you, but you can only have three different types, whether that be ballistic, like a cannon or missile for missile, particle for particle, etc. There's also some weapons that will do electromagnetic damage, which will just essentially disable parts of the ship. And if you're looking to be sort of a space pirate type, having an electromagnetic weapon on your ship is hugely important, especially when combined with the targeting control system to take out that ship in a very effective manner without actually destroying or damaging the ship too much. Some weapon systems will say turret as well, which means they fire automatically when you're in range. These are great on large ships like massive cargo hulls with low mobility because then you don't have to orientate yourself to actually have the target in your reticule. The turrets will do that for you and shoot them as long as you're within your range and sort of roughly facing them. Now, once you've decided what you're going for in terms of your weapons, make sure you go into the flight check and then assign the ship's weapons to each of these specific three slots so you can then actually use them in combat. Now, the last section is structural and I've left this for last because it's mostly like cosmetic upgrades to your ship but say if you are struggling to put weapons on your ship you can actually add specific spines that will give you additional weapon slots but for the most part here it's cosmetic and cowling and those sort of a changes. Consider here the mass that it is adding to your ship as that's the main focus for these. Something that I love adding to my ship on any sections is the portholes so you can actually like look through these when you're in space. I just find them like super cool so any like spare spot or node that I have available I just like put on a porthole because it just looks cool and using that like G attach method that we talked about earlier for each of the nodes like hovering over that node and then attach using the attach button to attach will really help you determine like what looks good because it'll just put it in place and you can sort of flick through the options quickly to find exactly what you're looking for but they're mostly structural changes to your ship that really define the different look. So now we have built this monstrosity of a ship that we have for this tutorial here but I, I hope your ship looks a little better than mine. So once you've built the ship you'll then go into the flight check. Now you can check this throughout the process of building the ship to see like what you need to change or edit that sort of thing but we've already talked about assigning your weapons in the weapon categories that's the first thing that you should do. For the turret type weapons you do need to assign them to a weapon category but you don't fire them manually because they fire themselves but you still need to assign them as you need to allocate the power when you're in that ship system. So pay attention to the warnings and errors here. If it's a warning you can still use the ship like it, it'll still work but if it is an error it means the ship won't actually fly and it will need to be corrected. You can also select all which will then allow you 
to like color all of your ship at once rather than specific parts or like if you're on pc you can hold control and left click to like select two parts or multiple parts if you want to just change the color of those now on this screen as well you can rename your ship and it's worth pointing that out because so many people don't know this is here so in the ship builder in the flight check and then the rename option will appear you can select the name of your ship here and call it whatever you like like this great name that i have chosen for this ship you know what to do We'll start with the basics of building an outpost and then we'll get into everything else. So the first thing that you do to build an outpost is to build one. You need to bring up your scanner and then press the outpost button and it will bring up the potential for you to place a beacon. Now you won't be able to place beacons close to like points of interest on planets. You'll need to be a certain distance away from them. One thing to pay attention to about where you're putting your outpost is in the top left corner where it has the available resources. It's really important to make sure that you're building these outposts on locations that actually can be able to extract certain resources, especially resources you're looking for. And it's also easier to bring up your scanner and your outpost beacon and just like move it around the world to like locate these materials inside the radius of where the outpost will actually be. It can help you sort of find those actual deposits in the ground. Once you've found a location that you like, you can then build the outpost beacon there. It's always good to have an outpost on a location that has multiple resources available so you can extract multiple resources, but we'll talk about that shortly. So place down that outpost and then you can get into the basics of building. So the general basics of building here, right? Like regardless of whether you've invested into skills and research, everything, you'll have some general items available to you to build structures as well as the most base level of extractors. And the things to pay attention to on the build screen here in the bottom left are the build limit, which is pretty large. I've never actually hit the build limit here. It's definitely larger than Fallout 4. And then on the right hand side, you've got cargo, which indicates the amount of cargo links that you have to that outpost. You've got crew so the amount of crew available at that outpost the needed power so how much power is actually being required by say your extractors or anything else and fabricators that you've built at that location the total power available based on the power you've provided as well as a production level based on what you're doing there and in terms of extracting or fabricating what have you you've also got the option to change your view which is by pressing v on a pc and whatever that button is on console which gives you that really nice top-down view which i really like like building from for these larger sort of structures that you can build in Starfield. There are plenty of skills you need to invest in to be successful into outpost management and outpost building. The first is research methods. Now this will reduce the amount of resources required to complete research projects. It's not necessary like a must have, but those resource requirements can be pretty expensive, especially when you get into some of the higher level research that you do need. The core one you need is outpost engineering. So what this allows you to do is construct the improved outpost modules and the higher tiers allows you to construct the higher outpost modules or research them at the research lab. Now you don't necessarily need to rank this out to rank four but if you do it will then give you fewer resources when you do build at those outposts which is definitely valuable to have. You all also need one rank of botany and one rank of zoology to unlock the animal husband trees and the greenhouses for your outposts as well. Planetary habitation at the bottom of the science tier is also really good so you can build outposts on planets that have extreme conditions and also increase the amount of outposts you have really valuable for say if you're trying to extract like all the resources or just like build on certain planets it can definitely help you with that as well special projects can also be helpful so you can craft some of the more unique resources that are used in some of the higher tier outpost modules as well you'll need to make them at the industrial workbench also the outpost management skill is great as well so you can have those additional cargo links and then additional robots or additional crew or additional extractors depending on the tiers that you get for outpost management. So once you've picked, say, some of these skills, especially outpost engineering, you'll need to head to a research lab. So you can check out my research and crafting guide here as well if you want like the full breakdown of all of this, but we'll cover it very briefly here, is that in the outpost tab, this is where you can research the better developments for your outpost, say having more decoration options available to you or increasing the power generation or robot options or defense or greenhouses or animal husbandry, what have you. It's all under this option and you'll need to invest in this system if you want to unlock the rest of all of the outpost modules which you absolutely should be doing if you want to invest in this system further because they are tangible upgrades especially say the increasing of your resource extractors and getting those higher tiers like the commercial ones will maximize the amount of resources you gain from them so it's definitely worth investing in before doing any research you should consume a neurojack so it reduces the amount of resources required to research projects but it also gives you a 50 percent chance for sudden developments to happen which essentially 
essentially just like gives you a material filled out for free and that just saves you so much resources as you do need to invest a ton of resources into this system. So in consuming that aid item is also very valuable. So let's talk about the different types of categories in the outpost builders. We'll go through each one individually and we'll start with the extractors as it's one of the simpler ones to sort of understand because the main purpose here is to extract materials. Now, every time you build an outpost, the extractor tab will be different depending on what you can extract at that specific outpost. So when your outpost is built within its radius, if there are any certain mineral deposits or water that you can pull up from the ground, you can also flick through the different variants, which will say like be the commercial variant, for example, may require more power, but it will actually extract more of that resource from the ground. Now, when you build these initially, they will need power and we'll talk about power in a little bit, but as they are powered, they will start extracting that resource and just extract them into its own container. Now you can create an outpost link on these items to either move them into a storage container or move them into a builder, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. But by pressing that option to create an outpost link, you can then connect the extractor to say a storage device or something else. And you want to create that link from the device that you want the resource to be sent from to that extra device that you want it to go to. But we'll cover that more extensively in a little bit as well. Power is the next category. Now, this is definitely an important category. Not only will it power your extractors, it'll power any lights you may have or defenses or anything else that you have built. Very worthwhile investing in power and upgrading it through the research tree. So initially you'll have like a solar array and a wind turbine. Now, these options both won't be available on every planet. It depends on what you've got on that planet. Say if the planet has no wind, it won't have like a wind turbine or so solar array for the same example. But always pay attention to the amount of power that these actually produce when you're looking at the menu option because some planets may produce a lot more power from wind than they would sun or vice versa but each of these will say how much they actually produce in terms of power and you'll obviously need more power like total power than you do needed power which you can view on that bottom right hand side as well so make sure you're building enough of these to actually power everything you've got unlike a fallout 4 you don't actually need to connect wires with your power stations as well just by building them they will power things in the general vicinity so you don't actually need to connect them manually via wiring or something like that this category also also includes lights, which are pretty self-explanatory. What they do, I don't know if I need to tell you what a light does, but just thought I'd call that out. The storage category is very important, just like extractors. So not only can you build, say, a storage container for solids, liquids, or gas to actually just store these resources you have extracted from the ground, you can also build a warehouse which can store like actual made resources that you are creating from your builders, or a transfer container. Now, a transfer container will hold resources at your outpost, and it will create an additional like tab in your cargo hold menu that will allow you to just pull resources directly from that outpost if you are in its general vicinity. You can't do this like cross system or something. You have to be like actually there, which is disappointing. I wish this would allow you to use it, say like in another system or something, but then I guess it's like just another free container. But the main purpose here is on those storage containers to hold these resources, especially if you are extracting a lot of resources and connecting them via cargo links to other sites. You want to have these larger storage containers to hold those resources so you can then pump them into builders or something which we'll talk about in a little bit but make sure that you're connecting these via those outpost links that we touched on earlier so you want to actually click on say the extractor or wherever you want the resource to start from and then select the storage container or where you actually want that resource to go into then that's how you connect those via the outpost links builders are a big category just like extractors now there are a couple of things to consider here from just the generic like fabricators or getting into the plants and animal husbandry trees. So we'll start with like the general fabricators. Now what you can do with fabricators is create any of these objects that you can create at an industrial workbench. The higher tiers of these like the compound fabricator will allow you to create the higher tiers of these crafted resources. Now when you're selecting these from the builders and you like flick through them and it'll say what it produces down the bottom whether it be like an adaptive frame or what have you you don't actually need to create that specific one. Once you've created a fabricator you can click on the terminal and select any of those options as long as the right fabricator for that specific type of material that you're trying to create. So in order to actually use these, you need to add the specific resource into them so you can actually create them. So in this example, I had my fabricator creating adaptive frames by pumping in iron and aluminium and which was coming from a cargo link and then into my storage container and then into the fabricator. But I wanted to change that to be a mag pressure tank. So in order to do that, I needed additional nickel as well as the aluminum that was already in my storage. So if I had set up say a nickel farm and that was going automatically into my storage container it would just pull that automatically but just to use this example I just added nickel to my storage container and then via
via that outpost link, it's just being automatically pumped into the fabricator and just creating mag pressure tanks for me automatically. Now you can actually pump these out of the fabricator if I wanted to say build a warehouse and then connect it via an outpost link. I could move these resources out of the fabricator into that warehouse, which has a higher storage limit. So then it just wouldn't get full because the fabricators do actually get full over time. So I can do that as well if you wanted to. The other two main ones in this category is the animal husbandry and the greenhouse. So for both of these, you need to go out and scan the fauna for the animal husbandry and the flora for the greenhouses in that specific planet. You will also need say botany and zoology for both of these to then research them at the research lab like we talked about earlier. Now it's also worth pointing out that if there is nothing available on that planet, say none of the flora or fauna can be produced at an outpost, you won't actually see these options in the menu. So it can be a little confusing, right? If you're wondering if that specific resource can be produced at an outpost, once you've fully scanned it, you'll see an option in that list that'll say outpost production allowed. That indicates to you that you can actually create it. And then if you go back to that outpost, you'll see say a greenhouse or an animal husbandry available to you. Not all of these resources can be produced, which can be a little confusing and also a little annoying if the specific resource that you want from that planet, you can't actually produce at your outpost. So once you've fully scanned, say the flora or the fauna, let's use the flora for example here, you can then go back to your outpost and create a greenhouse. And once you've created the greenhouse, you'll then need to provide it with the required resource similar to the other builders. So in this example, I'm trying to create structural and I also need to pump water into my greenhouse in order to do that. So then I can build a water extractor, connect it via the outpost link, and then it will actually start powering it and creating structural over time because I've also got enough power at my outpost as well. This is essentially exactly the same for the animal husbandry. You do need to scan them and make sure that they do say that the outpost production is allowed. And then by creating an animal husbandry facility, you'll actually spawn some friendly animals at your base and you'll need to then select the resource at the terminal that you're trying to create and you'll need to provide it with the specific nutrients or materials in order to create that other resource. So in this example here, we are creating nutrient and it needs to add fiber and water. So we would need to connect our builder with water and say fiber, which you could essentially create fiber from a greenhouse if that was available to you and then just pump both of those resources into the animal husbandry and it will then produce that other resource that you need out of it. So all of the things in the builder category are essentially around pumping in certain like raw materials into that device and then it will create something for you on the other side, whether that be a different type of resource or a crafted material like the adaptive frames we talked about earlier. Structures are a nice easy one to tie us over from the complexity that we just had. So these are essentially just like habitable areas that you can build with the different types. And really all the options here are cosmetic and up to your general feel that you want for your outpost and what you want to build. One thing I will note though is regardless of the option you build in the just the modify option, not the build menu of the sort of like build mode, you can then actually change certain things. Like say, if you're looking at a wall, you can change it to say, have a window. Or if you're looking at a doorway, sometimes you can change the type of doorway that's connecting it or remove the doorway if you wanted to. So when you're in that modify mode, you can actually change certain things. It's just worth calling out if you want to sort of change the general feel of these different modules. Crafting is the next one. Now the crafting one is pretty self-explanatory. Like this is just all of the crafting workbenches that are available to you. You can have these available to you on your ship or even at the constellation downstairs, but there's nothing special here. But the one that I will call out is the industrial workbench. So anything that we talked about in that builder section with those fabricators, you can actually craft them manually via the industrial workbench. This includes anything that requires say a special project. If you do have that skill, you'll be able to craft them there, which are needed for some of the higher tier certain modules you might create at your outpost. Defenses is the next category that contains all sorts of turrets that are available to you to build at the outpost to defend it if it ever gets attacked, whether that be by vicious creatures or something else. In my experience, I have never had an outpost actually attacked. Now that may be different for you if say you build it on a planet that has a bunch of aggressive animals or like if you've got the one to trait and people come to you or if you do a certain thing in the main story, which I won't mention, but there are definitely reasons to have defenses, but it's not going to be attacked as much as say a Fallout 4 where you're getting constantly spammed by raiders constantly attacking your settlements. Robots are a fun category, not only because they're cool, but because they also give you additional percentages to your production rates depending on the robot you built. So certain robots say like the Garden Mini bot will increase your production rate of organic resources. Those organic resources are things that come from your greenhouses by 10%. Different robots will give you different buffs. You can see them on the left-hand side. Like if you're building an 
engineering robot. It'll increase the production rate of your manufactured items. But there's plenty of options to pick here as you do increase your research level with the robots, you'll have more options. Furniture contains larger cosmetic items that you can build inside your outpost. Say things like chairs and beds and benches and stools and sleeping bags and all that good stuff. Now, some of these items are interactable, like say your beds and couches if you wanted to sleep, but for the most part, they are cosmetic. And that's exactly the same for decorations. Now, decorations are the smaller cosmetic items like your, say your posters, your storage containers, your safes, like those sort of things. And this is all like cosmetic things to sort of make your outpost look a bit more lived in and different ways that you can build them like plants and make them look nice. Displays are used to hold all of your cool items and weapons and armor that you've found throughout your playthrough. Now, the different types of displays will display different things. Display cases will display things from like the mist category that you may have. Weapon racks obviously display weapons and then the mannequins will display your armor. Depending on what you build here, you'll be able to then open up like the inventory screen and transfer items into that display case or weapon rack, etc. And it will just automatically display on the rack. If the rack or the display case is full, the extra items you place on there won't actually show. So just make sure you're not overloading them. But that's essentially how you sort of show off any cool things that you've collected throughout your playthrough. The miscellaneous category might be our last category, but it's quite a large one. So the first thing that you have here is scan boosters. Now there are different tiers of scan boosters, but essentially what these do is increase the range of your hand scanner. That's depending on the size of scan booster that you do build. So say the smaller ones, just double it and then the larger ones quadruple it. So essentially this means you can scan things from further away and find things further in the environment on that planet. So if you're looking for certain things, the next is cargo links, but we're going to do cargo links and the crew station separately. So just hold tight for a second. The next ones here that we have is the landing pads, both a small variant and the ship builder variant. I highly recommend building the ship builder variant. The small variant will only hold a small ship. And for the most part, you're probably going to have a ship that's too big for it. The larger variant with the ship builder allows you to like buy ships or modify your ship from it at your outpost. This is great to do because when you're looking to modify your ship here, basically every part is available for you to use in the ship builder, except for like the unique, like high tier custom ones that are required from certain star yards. But for the most part, every other component is available here. So definitely recommend building it from there. Now you've also got the mission boards here. Now you've got the standard mission board variant, the consolation mission board, as well as the self-service bounty clearance. The mission boards act exactly the same as they do when you find them at any of the different settlements and you can accept missions from them and go and complete them for credits. The self-service bounty clearance is definitely worth building at any of your outposts. So what you can do from here is clear any bounty that you may have without actually having to interact with that faction. By interacting with that faction, they're probably going to knock you of all of those credits, but then also steal any, well not steal because you stole them, but take any of those stolen items that you may have stolen from you. So if you got any contraband or stolen items, they'll take them when you get arrested. Whereas at one of these self-service bounty clearance machines, you can then clear your bounty without losing any of those stolen items that you may have actually taken. So let's talk cargo links and crew stations, but we'll start with cargo. So what a cargo link is, is it allows you to connect your outposts in order to transfer resources, whether that be raw materials or crafted resources from one outpost to another. The standard cargo link will only operate within a specific star system and it doesn't require any resources. You just need to build one of these at each of the outposts and then click on the terminal and connect them. You will need to add resources into the outgoing connection of that cargo link. So say if you're extracting certain materials, you'll need to use that outpost link that we talked about earlier, connect it into the outgoing. So then when the ship lands, it'll pull those resources out of outgoing and then it'll go to that other outpost and put them in the incoming at that other outpost. This is also available as like an inter-system link. So you can build the cargo link into system and that'll allow you to link it to other systems as well. Now you can only build a certain amount of cargo links at any of your outposts. And what I would recommend doing is having sort of like a relay outpost. So for example here, like on my Jemison outpost, which is my main one, I want most of the resources to be pumped into here, right? And because you can only connect a certain amount of cargo links, you can only have three per outpost, but each actual cargo link that you build can only have one link happening to it because I want to have multiple things being pumped into that. I've built a relay on a moon nearby on like the Kurtz outpost here where I can relay these cargo links into this system and then connect them all into one cargo link in the outgoing and then it will pull all of those resources together and take them all to my new Atlantis outpost. I hope that makes sense. Cargo links are pretty confusing but really the main thing to think about is just make sure you're connecting things via these outpost links. Think about the incoming and the outgoing and where they're actually going. Make sure you jump into the terminal and connect them 
to where they need to go. And then the inter-system ones, you'll need to actually pump helium into the additional fuel slot that these cargo links have. So you can do that by essentially if like that planet or moon actually has helium, you can just put the extractor straight into it. Or you can say build like a storage device and just put a bunch of helium in there and then use the outpost link to connect it to the fuel slot on that cargo link. But as long as it's got helium being provided to it, it will then move those objects to wherever it's actually connected to in order to go to. And lastly, we have the crew station. So by building a crew station, it will allow you to increase the crew slots available at that outpost. Now by assigning crew to your outpost, you can give you specific buffs like say Lin's outpost management, increasing the amount of cargo links that you can have. For example, you can view these the same as you would your crew by going into the crew roster screen. And then if you go to the current outpost, you'll specifically see the ones that are at that outpost. Your robots will also show up here as well, but they don't actually count towards your crew slots, but they do have a different limit that you can actually have in terms of your robots at each of your outposts. We'll start with my personal favorite one, and that's movement enhancements. So firstly, when you're looking at your boost packs and which boost pack to pick, during most of my playthroughs, especially during like the review period, I was trying to decide like what sort of a boost pack I was going to run. And I was looking at the skip pack and it's like, why would I even run this? It's just like a worse basic pack. It says it increased maneuverability, but like... It doesn't and I didn't really understand what the purpose of it was but if you go into the settings and into your bindings and the jump key if you bind the alternate key here to something else it actually has an entirely different form of boost it will actually propel you forward rather than up and this is the same for any boost pack right it's not just a skip capacity it works for all of them and that speed that it throws you at and the distance is significantly more than if you were just using like the typical space bar you can see in these comparisons right where I've like put a rug down here and I'm jumping off. There's a big difference between that first rug where I'm landing, which is just like the basic space bar jump and the second jump, which is that alt jump using the skip capacity pack. And it works for all of the different packs, right? It's just the skip capacity one is like the most obvious to see this because it's like that sort of short burst that propels you forward. It just makes exploration, exploring so much quicker and more enjoyable because, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I just like boost pack everywhere and being able to like do this like all the time and actually propel my myself forward has been significantly better. But there are other ways to improve your movement speed as well. The first is via AMP, which is a craftable cam that you can make at any cam station, which will give you a 35% increase to your movement speed for two minutes, which is very solid. Like absolutely would definitely recommend using this. Anytime you can increase your movement speed because we don't have vehicles is obviously fantastic. If you don't want to make these or you just want like another alternative, if you go to the red mile, you can grab the runner's rush, which will give you a 20% movement speed increase for three minutes. So not as fast but for a longer period of time plus the 25% O2 recovery so you can like sprint for longer so they both sort of even each other out right one's a little bit faster movement speed while the other has better O2 recovery but either of these options are absolutely worth grabbing just to increase that movement speed so you can zoom around better because I mean we're always zooming around in staff that are trying to get to locations and just like traveling around so it's definitely been a beneficial thing to grab. The next is for your outposts themselves now I don't want to cover anything that I've covered in other videos especially like my outpost guide that went through a ton of stuff for that. But one thing that I actually think I mentioned in that video that I found significantly annoying is that when you try to place items and you like rotate them, the rotation speed is so fast and you can't like get the intricacies of like lining things up perfectly. Pivot! But actually you can, it's in the settings again, under controls, there's outpost item rotation speed. Now you can change this, it originally it's at 5%, just knock this all the way down to 1%, honestly. And then you can actually use this to be able to place things correctly with the right orientation that you're looking for. Another tip for outposts as well is, you know how you can pick up items, right? Like just by holding the action key, you can like pick them up, you can rotate them and place them down for like trying to get that sort of clutter feel for your outpost. You don't actually have to do it this way. If you just like throw the item on the ground, whatever it is, and then bring up your modify mode in your build menu, you can actually still pick up that item and then place it using the build menu exactly where you want it to go, rather than having to try and finagle around with like the pick and rotate options that you get just from like using the physics in the game. So there's other ways you can do that to make it a little bit more beneficial. This is a common one that you may know, you may not know, but you can actually sort of farm legendaries in a way. So by going to a location and entering the location 
with your difficulty completely maxed out, more legendary or elite enemies will spawn and they have a higher potential chance of dropping higher quality and legendary gear. But to save you the headache of having to actually fight these enemies on that difficulty, once they've actually spawned, you can lower the difficulty back down. Their health and damage will reset, but that enemy is still the exact same enemy. So their loot table will still be the same and you have a higher chance of actually getting that higher quality epics and legendary gear. This I thought was going to get patched and it hasn't been patched yet. Maybe it'll get patched, but I've tested it on multiple like runs with the same area just going through and on the ultra hard like difficulty running this through and then essentially entering the area on the hard difficulty, then lowering it down to normal, killing all these guys and then testing it by going back to that quick save and then running it just completely on the normal difficulty. Basically every single time on the hard difficulty, I at least got one legendary and in 10 runs, I only got one legendary once on normal. So it definitely still works. They may patch it, but it's just worth pointing out that if you're trying to farm legendaries, this is a fantastic way to do. And speaking of gear in that similar way, weapons actually have tiers. Now, I didn't realize this for a long time, but when you're looking at weapons, they often say things like, you know, an assassin's weapon or what have you, but there is certain categories listed under there that actually reference the tier of the weapon. So initially, like there's like the basic tier, which is just the weapon itself. Then on top of that, there is calibrated, refined, and advanced, and advanced being the top. So paying attention to this will notice how sometimes weapons just seem to do like more physical damage. And it's because of this tier, it'll say if it's calibrated or refined or advanced. And you can see in this example here, I didn't actually have any calibrated versions. I couldn't find one, but you can see that the damage numbers actually significantly increased, even though this is just a basic Grendel, that actual physical damage is significantly more. So this is really important. Again, if you're looking at say legendaries and you come across weapons and things that aren't as powerful, like if they've got really good legendary effects, but they're just like a basic tier, you'll later in the game find that just like an advanced weapon that's significantly more damage. And it's like, well, probably want to switch to that. And it's also worthwhile to farm legendaries in that way to try and get them on that advanced tier so you can keep them for longer. So pay attention to that as it makes a significant difference. It also affects armor in the exact same way. Armor ratings are exactly the same. And while we're talking about weapons, did you know that with electromagnetic guns, you can actually charge them? So electromagnetic guns, as you know, if you shoot enemies, you'll like knock them out. If you hold down like the shoot button and then shoot, you'll actually deal more EM damage to them and they have like that charged effect. And in some cases you can just like one shot knock them out by charging the EM weapon rather than like tapping it. I don't know why it doesn't tell you this and it doesn't even make it clear that you can charge them. There's no like visual indicator except the gun has like a tiny little shake, but you can actually charge them in that way. You may remember in the Skyrim days how you could just like put a bucket on someone's head and then stealth around and steal stuff from them. In Starfield, it is kind of similar, but a little bit different in that the chameleon armor allows you to literally just stand in front of people and steal things like they don't even notice you. Now you need at least two pieces of chameleon armor. You can't just have the one. One will make you invisible, but you're still detectable for some reason. If you have two, you are completely undetectable. Even if you're standing literally in front of the person, you can just steal things as much as you like. Now, once you've stolen all of those goods, if you want to remove the stolen tags, so if you do actually get arrested, you don't actually lose them. You can either sell them to a vendor like the trade authority and then immediately buy them back and then lose the stolen tag. Or if it's just like a weapon or an armor, you can actually go to a crafting table and mod that piece of gear and it will lose that tag. It just saves you that money. Obviously, you lose the materials for doing the crafting, but it saves you the income of having to say sell it and buy it back and that sort of a thing but weapons and armor instead you can do this by even adding a mod removing a mod any of that and it will actually remove the stolen tag as well and as another note for the stealth players when you're wearing armor even if it's like hidden because you know you're in a settlement or something like that it still has a sound and it makes a ton of sound because you're literally wearing a giant space suit so take that off if you're trying to do any stealth activities when you're exploring planets and trying to max out the survey there are sea creatures that are super easy to miss. The only way you will, well, not the only way, but the main way you'll find them is landing on coastal areas because you can't land right in the ocean, right? And when you're looking at these biomes, if you are sort of like trying to land right on the border of the land and the ocean, sometimes the biome name will change to have in brackets coast. Now, if you go to these locations, you'll actually find like, you know, a beach and be able to find those sea creatures just swimming around in the water. You can jump in the water and try, go and get them if you want as well. But worth noting, 
that the same with flying creatures, sea creatures, you can actually scan from ages away even without upgrading your scanner. So you don't have to get close to them, though you could just kill them, right, to get the experience. And then when you kill things, it instantly scans them as well. But just worth pointing out that it's a super frustrating thing for exploration that sometimes it'll say like you're 100% explored and you can't find something. Chances are it's probably a sea creature. To expand on exploring even more, when you're looking at planets in the star map, when you're looking at the two sides of the planet, right, the side that looks at the sun versus the dark side of the planet, if you land on the side that's actually facing the sun, it'll be daytime on that planet compared to on the other side, it'll be nighttime. So if you want to explore a planet at daytime or just want to spend time in the day, like personally, I hate nighttime in games. I don't know why, it's just a thing that I do. But if you want to explore during the day, land on the daytime side of the planet. And you can also tell which planets or systems you have actually visited before on the star map. If it's like a glowing white sphere, then you've been there. If it's just a white sphere, you haven't been there. And if it's a red sphere, then you can't actually get there or you haven't actually explored a route to even find that planet. When mining as well, you can right click your mining laser to like charge up the beam so that it deals more damage if you're using it in combat or actually mine things faster. This is super useful for some of those like higher tier mining deposits that take forever to mine. If you actually right click charge up your mining laser, it takes significantly less time. Now in combat, there is multiple healing items that most people haven't realized. So obviously there are med packs and it's pretty simple what that does, but there's also emergency kits and trauma kits. Trauma kits will give you 10% of your health back, whereas emergency kits will give you 15%. So you can clearly see this by actually just looking at the items and using them. And obviously you want to use emergency packs here because they give you more of your health back, but it is only an over the time effect. So food can instantly regenerate health, although it is a little bit like it's not heaps of health. It's only a little bit and you can buff all of these via the medicine skill. But looking out for emergency kits, it gives you much more health than med kits, by the way. You also shouldn't use ship technicians to register new ships. You can actually do this from the ship screen. There's a real register option and you can do this. This is significantly cheaper than doing it from the vendors. I don't know why. To me, I think it's to do with the commercial skill as that does affect the economy because the more commercial skill you have, the higher the ship's actual, you know, sell price, which would then affect the registering fee, I think, but I don't rightly know, but it's just cheaper every single time if you just go into the ship screen and register it from there rather than actually doing it from the ship technician themselves. And speaking of ships, certain ship parts are hidden by your level. So you can see in this example here at level 15, there is like virtually very little amount of ship parts, especially weapons. And then if I um, just somehow become level 300, I don't know how that happened, you can see that the amount of ship parts is significantly more expanded than if I was still at level 15. So it's worth pointing that out that don't invest too early in your ship as well because so many more parts will become available to you the further levels you go. I've got one more fun one for you guys, which I didn't realize until like my third time through the Vanguard mission. But when you go and do the Vanguards and if you go to the pilot mission, there's actually a terminal there that you can click on, which will add debug tools. So you can add an ally or increase your damage or your shields but if you click the fourth option you can actually hack the system and give you these buffs permanently for the entire run which will then allow you to complete tier six and you know get that good feeling from commander twala as he tells you that you you know did so well even though you cheated the system but it's another thing to point out as well so what we're talking about today is the Starborn powers. I've been itching to make this video for so long, but I wanted to wait until most people have at least heard of what this is. And I didn't want to spoil it for anyone. And I apologize if I have spoiled it for people, but it's just one of those things, you know, content creation can be a bee sometimes. So the Starborn powers come from completing the Into the Unknown quest. Once you've done that, you'll actually get your first power and then the other powers will become accessible to you. So essentially like from that point onwards, you'll either find in the world, like these temples when you enter systems, you'll get like a quest pop up to say that you can actually go and get them or by talking to Vlad, he'll actually point you to where you can find the temples. If you don't want to like go and search for them yourself, you can literally just talk to Vlad every single time and he'll tell you exactly where to go for every single temple. That's how I got all 24 of them. There is 24, by the way. The whole process is pretty much the same for all of them. You sort of enter and you do the little spinny thing and then you get the power and at the end, you have to fight a guardian. The guardians can be a bit tricky depending on the system that the temple is in. They do give some good experience as well as the quantum S 
essence. That essence on the power screen, you can actually like use one and it will increase your like power regen speed for the next 60 seconds. So say if you're in like a tough fight or encounter and you want to use those powers a lot, then definitely pop one of these as the regen is huge. It actually gives you a really solid amount of regen. But let's talk about the best powers themselves. Now, the first one is like inarguably the best power and that is personal atmosphere. So this creates a small area of unlimited oxygen around you for a duration. Now, this doesn't sound that good, but what makes this really good is just general exploration. Like when you're exploring on planets, for me, when I'm exploring, I just hold down that sprint button, right? And then once my CO2 maxes out, I just pop this. It completely restores your O2 and has unlimited O2 for a period of time. You can just sprint forever. And then once it eventually runs out, you lose all your CO2 again. You've probably got a backup, so you can just keep using it again. It's also really good, say, if you are over encumbered, you know, when you're over encumbered and every time you like walk or sprint, your O2 will actually start to deplete. This just gives you unlimited O2. So you can actually get back to your ship if you need to like drop something or, you know, you just don't want to lose what you've got for a period of time and stop actually losing O2. It can really help with that as well. Elemental pool is a lot of fun as well. So this will blast inorganic resources and pull them towards you. So that's like any of the mining deposits that you see around. When you see like rock deposits with these, you can just pop this near them and you'll just like instantly collect those resources. It just saves you the time from having to like mine them with your miner. It's just a little convenience factor. Elemental harvest is similar in that way, except it regrows flora once you're like in an area. So if you pick say the fruit from something and then you use elemental harvest, it'll instantly regrow it and you can pick it again. This is really good if you're like trying to farm certain resources. And the area that it does it in is actually pretty large as well. It's not just the one that's directly in front of you. So you can like, if you've got a collection of flora that's there, right? You can collect them all, pop this and then go and harvest them again. Precognition is a lot of fun too. So this will allow you to see where people are going to essentially like walk. But if you're in dialogue, it will actually tell you exactly what they're going to say to your dialogue response. You can't actually use this to like pass persuasion checks or something like that, like I've tried, but it's just a fun little thing that you can see what people are going to say depending on what you say. So say if you're doing certain quest lines, you just want to know what's going to happen if you say certain things that can be useful for that way. The main use for these powers is definitely combat. There are plenty of others that you can tinker and play with but these are like the best combat powers that i've found we'll start with phased time so this will slow the flow of time for a period so you can line up headshots and just basically destroy enemies without being hit you do slow down as well so if you're like a reload or something it does take the same amount of time while being slowed but if you've got like a full clip and you pop this you can usually kill the enemies that are pretty close to you gravity wave isn't very good it's sort of like a worse fuss radar but gravity well is actually really good so this will suck literally everything that isn't nailed down into an area including enemies i use this a lot for some harder enemies and bosses because it essentially like stun -like them because they won't attack while this is active and they're stuck in it so if you're you know you've got enemies that are quite difficult or you're at the end of some sort of a dungeon with like bosses there this will really help for those encounters sunless space again is very similar in that it will really help for those bosses what this does is it will shoot a ball of ice into an area it'll explode and freeze anything that's in that area and they'll just essentially fall to the ground you'll just be able to shoot them while they're down there so both of these are great for those sort of encounters that you can use and i use them a fair bit because of their AOE potential as well. Creator's Peace is a kind of fun. So this pacifies all enemies in an area and disarms them for a duration. Now this only works for enemies. You can't use this on allies to have them like drop their weapons, but on any enemies, you can just have them drop their weapons and then you can pick them up and then they have no weapons. So if they, once that effect wears off and they do attack you, they're just going to punch you, right? Just another way to help in those sort of difficult encounters to have enemies drop their weapons. It obviously doesn't work on aliens. Like they don't have weapons, so they're not going to drop them but you can use this on spaces crimson fleet pirates what have you parallel self is a ton of fun so this will summon another version of you from an alternate dimension for a duration and this version will have like the same armor and weapons that you have equipped at the time that you press that button so say if you've got a giant minigun then you can hold that minigun and then pop this your self will then have that minigun you can switch to whatever other weapon you wanted to use but there's a lot of fun that you can have because they'll just have whatever you have equipped and it just gives you another ally in combat so if you've already got a companion, it gives you another one. So you've got the freedom there. It doesn't really come up very often, but you can also use alien reanimation in a similar way. So you can like resurrect a dead alien to fight alongside you for a period of time. For the most part, like alien encounters are either pretty rare unless you're specifically going out to like look for them or they're like not super involved. But either way, like if there's aliens around, you can then reanimate them to fight. This is just like a little fun mechanic. And you can do a similar thing with the inner demon to like make 
make human enemies like create a copy of themselves and like then they attack each other so there's some fun things you can do with these but alien reanimation and parallel self are pretty good there are two defensive powers and they're both really really good the first is reactive shield so this will create a shield in front of you that will block any projectiles and in some cases reflect them back to the attacker this only works in front of you though so if you've got enemies attacking from the side or behind it won't work or like say if there's an explosion on the ground right it's obviously not going to block that but it's a fun thing say if you're like in a doorway or like a choke point you can stand there and then have all of the enemies shoot into it and then you won't take any damage and likewise moon form does a very similar thing but it locks you in place so when you activate moon form you can't move but you essentially turn into stone and all of your resistances are increased greatly now you very rarely can die when moon form is active like you will take some tiny little bits of damage depending on the armor that you have equipped but essentially you just become a god and you can just stand there and deal a ton of damage this is great to combine with effects that do additional damage or say resistances when you're standing still so you can just stand in the middle of a fight and just mow enemies down it's really good to use again it's a great effect to use for those sort of boss encounters to prevent you from dying you can just stand there and melt away at them there is two fun stealth abilities that i highly recommend using the first is void form this is probably one of the funnest abilities so you wrap yourself in light and become nearly invisible for a duration even if enemies know exactly where you are and you crouch and use void form they will lose you so they will continue to shoot in like the area you were just because like they're you know looking for you but you can essentially crouch void form walk away they'll shoot in that area you can get behind them and then sneak attack or do any of that sort of stuff or even just use it as like a mis like an escape mechanic if you wanted to get away from enemies say you're you know bitten off more you can chew and you want to escape you can do that as well sense star stuff is great this will give you like wall hacks and it'll essentially detect all life around you it's really really good for stealth missions i use this all through that reusion mission if you know you know because it will just show where enemies are around you you can see if you're going to like walk around a corner and there's going to be an enemy there or something and you can just use this out in the world too say if you know you're trying to find enemies or you know you want to avoid combat with them you can do it in that way i have a ton more specific guides on the channel as well that aren't in this video like all the best free ships all the best paid ships all the best homes or how to get into new game plus which i'll link all of that stuff here if you want to go check out that playlist but thank you guys for watching this video till the end thank you to our members for supporting the channel my name is norza and i hope you have a great day